When I moved to Vancouver for my job as a tech consultant, I was assigned to an office in the heart of historic Gastown. Unlike the sleek, modern buildings that dominate the city's skyline, Gastown, with its cobblestone streets and vintage architecture, retains a sense of history. And within that history, one of the most intriguing stories is about Gassy Jack, the area's legendary founder and the steam clock that stands on Water Street. Folklore has it the Gassy Jack spirit still wanders around Gastown, making sure things are running smoothly. Legend also tells of an ethereal keeper of time, a phantom clocksmith who tends to the steam clock. Said to be a friend of Gassy Jack in life, the keeper of time purportedly ensures that the clock never falters, a guardian of temporal order in a constantly changing world. I heard these stories from my colleagues and local shopkeepers, always accompanied by a chuckle, but everything changed one foggy winter evening as I was leaving the office. It was already dark outside, and the mist was so dense that I could barely see a few feet ahead. Walking by the steam clock, I noticed something odd. The hands were stuck at 11.59. This was unusual because the clock, powered by a steam engine and supposedly looked after by the mythical keeper, was famous for its punctuality. Just as I took out my phone to check the time, I heard a soft clanking noise behind me. Turning around, I saw an elderly man with white hair and a bushy beard, tinkering with the clock's mechanism. Dressed in an old-fashioned waistcoat and a bowler hat, he looked like someone straight out of the 19th century. Stuck, is it? I ventured. Ah, just a minor hiccup, he said without looking up. Time is a tricky thing to manage, you see. As he worked, the clock emitted a loud hiss and started to chime. It was exactly midnight. The hands moved again, and the mist suddenly lifted, as if respecting the clock's authority. The elderly man wiped his hands on a cloth and smiled at me. There we go, all set. Time marches on, as it should. Are you the keeper of time? I asked, half jokingly. He chuckled. Oh, I've been called many things. A guardian, a keeper, a clocksmith, but names are fleeting. It's the work that endures. And then, almost as if he was evaporating into the air, he stepped back into the mist and disappeared. I blinked in disbelief and stared at the clock. It was functioning perfectly. I can't explain what happened that night, but it turned me into a believer. Every time I walk past the steam clock now, I think of that mysterious figure and the folklore of Gastown. The keeper of time, if he was indeed that, had taught me something profound. In a world obsessed with the future, there's value in being the guardian of the present moment. For whether it's a bustling modern city or a cobblestoned relic of the past, every place has its keepers, its guardians, its folklore. And sometimes, you don't need to see to believe. You just need to take the time to listen to the stories, the chimes, and the whispers of history that guide us through the complexities of modern life. I work as a night guard at Alcatraz Island, the infamous former prison located in San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz has been many things, a military fortification, a military prison, and later a maximum security federal penitentiary. But for the last several decades, it has stood as a tourist attraction, a place where people can come and glimpse the darker aspects of human history. When you work the night shift at a place like Alcatraz, you encounter stories of hauntings, whispers of Al Capone playing his banjo in the shower room, or cries of prisoners long gone, still echoing in the cells. These stories didn't bother me much. I've never been the superstitious type, and years on the job made me familiar 
almost comfortable with the island's grim ambiance. However, local folklore speaks of something else, a figure known as the Lone Wanderer. Unlike the hauntings that are confined to the cells and specific locations within the prison, this entity is said to wander around the island. The legend goes that he was a prisoner who loved the sea. During his sentence, he was a well-behaved inmate and earned the right to do some gardening as a daytime job. They say he was plotting an escape, intending to swim across the bay, but he was caught and thrown into solitary confinement where he passed away, never seeing the open ocean again. The lone wanderer, they say, still roams the island at night, searching for his lost chance at freedom. One evening, a thick fog rolled in over the Bay Area. The fog in San Francisco is different. It's thicker, almost palpable, like you could grab a handful if you tried. That night, I was doing my usual rounds, walking with my flashlight and radio. The tourists had long since departed, and it was just me and the echoes of my footsteps. I reached the gardens, the place where, according to legend, the lone wanderer used to work. I don't know if it was the fog or the solitude, but something felt off. The air was denser, and I had a peculiar feeling of being watched. That's when I heard it. Footsteps. Not my own, but another set, faint and inconsistent, as if hesitating. I shined my flashlight in the direction of the sound, but it revealed nothing. Unease crawled up my spine, but I convinced myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I continued my rounds until I reached the edge of the island that faced the open sea, where the fog was now so thick I could barely see a few feet in front of me. And that's when I saw him. A figure, indistinct but unmistakably human, standing at the edge, looking out toward the ocean. For a moment, I froze. My radio, my flashlight, they all seemed irrelevant. The figure stood there for what felt like an eternity, but was probably just a few seconds. And then, as quietly as he appeared, he walked away, dissipating into the fog. I stood there, my heart pounding, both terrified and fascinated. Was it the lone wanderer? I can't say for sure. What I do know is that I felt an unexplainable sense of sorrow, tinged with a freedom I have never felt before. A freedom that can only come when you're so close to achieving something you've yearned for, but are held back at the final moment. The next day I went through the security footage but found nothing. No signs of anyone walking the island. I have continued my nightly round since then, occasionally standing at the edge, looking out into the sea contemplating the story of the Lone Wanderer. Even today when the fog rolls in and the atmosphere turns heavy, I can't help but feel a presence, an entity bound by longing and unfulfilled wishes. I haven't seen him again, but I often wonder, does he find solace in his eternal solitary walks, or is he forever haunted by the sea he can never touch? I took a job as a part-time night concierge at the Awani Hotel in Yosemite National Park, not expecting much beyond the mundane tasks of checking guests in and out, or giving directions to tourists who'd lost their way. Having spent most of my childhood in California, I was well acquainted with the rumors about the indigenous Miwok tribes and their legends, but I never took them seriously until one night at the hotel. The Awani, designed with both Native American and Art Deco influences, is said to have borrowed its name from the Miwok tribes who once lived in the Yosemite Valley. Awani means the place of a gaping mouth, and if that doesn't spell uncanny, I don't know what does. My older colleagues often said that the name wasn't just a poetic description of the valley, but had a more ominous undertone. On the night in question, 
I was at the front desk, flicking through a trashy mystery novel I'd picked up to pass the time. The clock struck midnight, and the hotel was silent except for the occasional creak of its old wooden floors settling. I glanced at the large stained glass panels depicting the Miwok legends, which seemed to shimmer in the moonlight. I'd always found them charming, but tonight they looked different, almost alive. Suddenly, the light above the front desk flickered, and the hotel's old-fashioned landline rang. Startled, I picked it up. Awani Hotel, how may I assist you? Static buzzed on the other end, but through it, I heard what sounded like chanting, soft and ethereal. I listened closer and realized that the chant resembled the Miwok language. I couldn't make out the words, but the tune sounded like a traditional prayer. Who is this? I asked. The line went dead. Unsettled, I recalled one of the Miwok myths. The story of Usumate, a spirit said to wander the valley, singing songs to bless the land, but also to ward off intruders. The legend never particularly interested me until now. A series of coincidences, I told myself, trying to shake off the discomfort. Just then, the lights flickered again, but this time I saw a shadow move across one of the large dining halls visible from the reception. I considered staying put, but my sense of duty got the better of me. I walked cautiously toward the hall. As I entered, I saw an ephemeral figure near a grand piano, its form resembling a Miwok shaman, draped in ceremonial robes. It looked up, seemingly making eye contact before vanishing into thin air. I returned to my desk, my heart pounding. My logical mind sought rational explanations, but I couldn't find any. Was it Osumate? Was I the intruder he sought to ward off? Or was he in some inexplicable way blessing the place he considered sacred? The experience transformed the way I saw the Awani and the valley it stood in. These legends, I realized, weren't just stories, but the spiritual imprints of those who'd walked this land long before us. Though I never experienced anything of that sort again during my time at the Awani, I found myself paying silent respects to Usumate whenever I passed the stained glass panels depicting the Miwok myths. Rational or not, it felt like the right thing to do. I work as an archivist in the San Juan Capistrano Public Library. The library, aside from its usual fare of books and multimedia, has a small but significant collection of historical documents, old photographs, and newspapers, most of them related to the famous Mission San Juan Capistrano. The mission is known for many things, most popularly for the return of the swallows every year, but it also has darker legends. Among them is the haunting of a woman named La Llorona. La Llorona is the weeping woman, a legend that transcends all boundaries. While its origins are in Mexican folklore, the story has found resonance in California as well. The version that circulates here tells of a woman who was betrayed by her love and, in a fit of despair, drowned her children in the Mission's Creek. Realizing what she'd done, she wailed loudly, a cry so devastating that it's said to still reverberate on moonlit nights around the mission grounds. Now, I've always been skeptical of legends and myths. To me, they were cautionary tales to keep children obedient, or stories to add flavor to a town's history. That was until one winter evening, when I stumbled upon something uncanny. I was working late, sorting through a recent donation of old newspapers and photographs. A particular photograph caught my eye. It was a grainy black and white picture of a group of people standing in front of the mission. I couldn't place the date, but their clothing looked like they were from the early 1900s. 
What intrigued me was the faint outline of a woman standing apart from the group, her eyes hollow and her expression one of despair. Curious, I decided to scan the image to examine it more closely, but when the scan came through, the mysterious woman was missing from the image. I cleaned the scanner, thinking it was a malfunction, but she remained absent in every subsequent scan. Puzzled, I decided to lock up for the night. I left the library and began my short walk past the mission on my way home. The mission's bells hung silently in the Campanario, and a bright moon hung overhead. I felt the air around me grow colder, and a soft cry echoed on the wind, a wailing that seemed to seep from the very walls of the mission. Chilled, I picked up my pace. As I crossed the bridge over the creek, where La Llorona was said to have committed her terrible act, I heard a splash. I turned around, and in the moonlight I saw a figure standing in the water, a woman, her eyes hollow, and her face filled with an eternal sorrow. Our eyes met for just a moment, and a shiver ran down my spine. Then she vanished, and the crying ceased. I ran home, my skepticism shattered. The next day I found the photograph missing from the collection, as if it had never existed. Since that night, I've not heard the wailing again, but I've also never doubted the legend of La Llorona. So, if you ever find yourself near the mission on a moonlit night, and hear a soft cry on the wind, remember the tale of the weeping woman, and know that some legends are grounded in a reality we may never fully understand. I'm not one to believe in ghost stories, but the night I spent at the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California, shifted my stance just a tad. You see, I'm a history grad student, and my research often involves studying architectural eccentricities and what they reveal about the zeitgeist of a particular era. Naturally, the Winchester House had been on my list. According to local folklore, Sarah Winchester, the widow of William Wirt Winchester of the famous rifle manufacturing company, built the house in a never-ending maze-like design to appease and confuse the spirits of those killed by Winchester rifles. Construction continued 24-7 until her death, resulting in a labyrinthine mansion with doors that led to nowhere, staircases that ended abruptly, and hallways that twisted in maddening directions. My advisor somehow managed to arrange for me to stay overnight in the mansion to immerse myself in the ambience for an upcoming paper. Armed with my notebook and a flashlight, I was led into the grand ballroom with its Tiffany glass windows and ornate wooden panels, where I'd be spending the night. Around midnight, as I was jotting down observations about the intricate cornices and wainscoting, I heard it. Soft footsteps in the hallway. I initially brushed it off as the house settling. This place was old, after all. But then I heard a door creak open followed by a delicate murmur that seemed to be a soft tune, or perhaps a lament. My heart quickened. Was it a nocturnal tour? Maybe. Curiosity outweighing my apprehension, I left the ballroom and stepped into the hallway. I walked cautiously through the maze, each turn seemingly taking me further from my point of origin. It felt as if the house was absorbing me, then I arrived at the seance room, where it said Sarah Winchester communicated with spirits for building instructions. The air inside felt thick and charged. I felt a subtle but definite pull towards the room. As I stepped inside, I saw the most extraordinary thing. Three wooden planchettes, commonly used in spirit boards, slowly moving on a table by themselves forming what seemed like letters. My skepticism battled with the evidence before me. 
but before I could take a closer look, a cold gust of wind blew through the room, scattering the planchettes. I ran back to the ballroom, retracing my steps as best as I could, and locked myself in for the night. Come morning, I thanked the caretaker and left, my notebook teeming with more questions than answers. People say Sarah Winchester built a house to confuse spirits, but I can't help but wonder if she ended up capturing them instead, in its endless hallways and mysterious rooms. Whether the experience was a figment of my imagination, or a brush with the other side, it left me with a newfound respect for folklore. So here I am, back at my desk, piecing together the history of a house that defies all architectural logic, with an anecdote that defies all scientific reason. Will it make its way into my academic paper? Probably not. But it will certainly stay in my mind as the night the Winchester Mystery House turned me, if only for a fleeting moment, into a believer. The air had a sharp chill as I wandered through the dense forest of Belarus, not far from the village of my grandmother. I had often heard stories of the mischievous spirits and entities that lurked in these woods, but like most of the younger generation, I dismissed them as tales to keep children from wandering too far. The day had started sunny and cheerful, but as evening approached, an eerie fog settled making visibility almost non-existent. Despite my logical mind, I felt a shiver of unease. The stories of my childhood echoed in my ears. The Zedka, forest spirits that could lead you astray or reward you. And the Pelevic, spirits of the fields that appeared at noon and sunset, sometimes harmful and sometimes benign. Walking slowly, my shoes crunched on the leaves, but then I heard a different sound, the soft, delicate laughter of a child. Thinking it was perhaps a villager's kid lost in the woods, I called out, Hello? The laughter continued, leading me farther and farther away from my known path. It seemed like hours had passed when I finally reached a clearing. There, in the middle of the clearing, stood a circle of ancient stones, each covered in moss. In the center of the circle, a young girl with pale, almost translucent skin and wearing a white dress danced, her laughter echoing around her. As she turned, her eyes met mine. They were an unnatural shade of green. She beckoned me forward. I felt a magnetic pull but deep inside, a voice screamed for me to stay back. The girl seemed to embody both innocence and malevolence. I've been waiting for you, she whispered in a voice that seemed older than her appearance. Come dance with me. Entranced, I took a step forward, but suddenly a loud caw broke the spell. A raven landed on one of the stones, its eyes fixed on me. It cawed again, more urgently this time. The girl hissed, her face distorting into something less human, more sinister. Leave, she screamed at the bird, but the raven merely cawed louder, flapping its wings aggressively. Shaking my head, trying to clear the fog from my mind, I backed away from the circle. The girl's scream pierced the air as she began to vanish her form dissolving into the mist. The raven, now calm, hopped down from the stone and transformed. Before me stood an elderly woman with silver hair, her voice lined with wisdom and age. She sighed deeply. Young one, you were almost ensnared by the Zedka. She tries to trap souls, making them dance for eternity. I am a guardian of these woods, and the ravens are my allies. You must be more careful and respect the spirits, both good and evil. 
Feeling shaken and overwhelmed, I nodded. Thank you, I whispered. She gave a gentle smile. Remember the tales of your ancestors. They hold truths and warnings. With that, she transformed back into a raven and flew away. I quickly made my way back to the village, my heart racing. The stories of my grandmother were not mere tales. They were rooted in the very soil of Belarus. And from that day on, I listened to those tales with newfound respect and awe. Belarus, a country known for its rich folklore, replete with tales of spirits and otherworldly beings, was never a place I associated with the supernatural until my own peculiar experience. I was in the small village of Kasava for a cultural festival. The quaint town was a hive of activity, with locals dressed in traditional attire, artisans displaying their wares, and musicians playing folk tunes. However, the centerpiece of the event was a dramatic reenactment of a famous Belarusian legend about the Rysalka, a type of Slavic water nymph or mermaid known for luring men to their watery graves. As darkness enveloped the sky, a group of performers gathered around a bonfire near a pond at the edge of the village. They performed the tale with captivating intensity their voices mingling with the flickering flames and reflecting off the still water. The story concluded with a warning, never walk near the water alone at night or the Rusalka may take you. After the event, the crowd dispersed, but the story stayed with me, echoing in my thoughts. I decided to take a brief walk to clear my head before heading back to my lodgings. I found myself drawn to the pond where the performance had taken place. The night was calm, the air filled with the scent of damp earth and blossoming flowers. I stood at the edge of the pond, watching the moon's reflection dance on the rippling water. Then I heard it, a soft, melodious singing, so ethereal that it seemed to come from the depths of the pond itself. My rational mind told me it was a trick of the wind, or perhaps some local enjoying the solitude. But another part of me recalled the legend of the Rusalka. The singing grew louder, more insistent, and I felt an inexplicable urge to step closer to the water. Just as my foot hovered over the edge, I felt a firm grip on my shoulder. Startled, I turned to see an old woman, her eyes filled with a mix of relief and warning. Never listen to the songs at night, she whispered, her voice tinged with urgency. The Rusalka is real, and she lures souls. Go back to the village, young one. This is no place for you. The singing abruptly stopped, as if the pond itself had heard the old woman's words. I thanked her, my heart pounding with a mixture of fear and gratitude, and made my way back to the village the weight of her warning settling deep within me. The rest of my trip was uneventful, but the experience at the pond left a lasting impression. I can't say for sure whether the Rusalka is real or merely a figment of collective folklore, but that night in Kasava, I felt something. A presence, a lure, a glimpse into the unknown. Whether folklore or fact, the legends of Belarus now hold a very real place in my understanding of the world, a haunting reminder that some ancient tales may carry more truth than we dare to admit. The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, 
On certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated, gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge. Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone, but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. 
but the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. Nightfall in the forest has its own language. The rustling leaves, the far-off hoot of an owl, and the subtle creaks of swaying trees form a symphony that speaks to the insomniac in me. On nights when sleep is a distant promise, I find myself outside, in a small clearing near my cabin, staring at the sky sprinkled with stars. But it was last night that the forest revealed a chapter of its language I had never understood before. I stepped into the clearing, my eyes tracing the familiar constellations. Orion's Belt, Cassiopeia, Ursa Major. Just as I began to retreat back to the cabin, I noticed it. The shadows of the trees were shifting. Not the way shadows normally do, flitting and fading with the passing clouds or moonlight, but in a deliberate, rhythmic motion. The towering shapes of oaks and pines morphed their silhouettes transforming into figures so massive, they seemed like giants. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and even pinched myself. The shapes remained. They danced in slow circles, their movements synchronized with the songs of the night, each sway of their elongated arms in harmony with the rustle of leaves, each step in tune with the creaking of branches. My heart thudded in my chest, not out of fear, but awe. My feet felt anchored to the ground, as if the very earth commanded me to witness this hidden ritual. I fumbled for my phone, considering capturing this surreal spectacle, but something stopped me. The act felt intrusive, like snapping a photo in the middle of a sacred ceremony. So I watched, my eyes wide, my breaths shallow, as the giants continued their dance. As the first light of dawn began to stretch across the sky, the figures gradually retreated, their forms disentangling from the shapes of giants back into the gnarled branches and trunks of trees. Just like that, the forest returned to its usual self, as if the giants had been nothing more than figments of my imagination. I walked back to the cabin in a daze, the image of the dancing giants imprinted on my mind like an indelible ink. Throughout the day, I pondered what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light, a vivid dream, or perhaps a rare glimpse into the forest's hidden folklore? Tonight, I find myself back in the clearing, watching the sky transition from the hues of sunset to the deep blue of night. The shadows stretch and loom as darkness descends, but there are no dancing giants this time. Whether they were a one-time marvel or a regular event for which I lack the secret schedule, I may never know. However, the forest seems different to me now, more alive, more enigmatic, a place of mysteries and untold tales. I feel privileged to have witnessed its hidden dance, a spectacle that's added a new layer of wonder to my nights. And so, every evening, I continue to step out into the clearing, not just to look for the giants, but to listen, to observe, to be a part of the forest's ever-evolving language. Even if the giants never return, their dance remains etched in my memory, a secret chapter in my ongoing relationship with the night, a silent pact with the hidden rhythms of nature. The hike started like any other, a blend of sunlight and shadow, fresh air, and the freedom that only a trail could offer. My backpack settled comfortably on my shoulders as I took the familiar path leading up toward the mountain summit. Birds offered their songs as if to cheer me on. Everything was right in the world, that is, until I stumbled upon the clearing. A gnarled tree stood at its center, 
its limbs reaching outward like a pleading gesture. Around the trunk, tattered pieces of paper were pinned, remnants of past hikers and their ventures. As a hiker myself, I knew it was a tradition. Leave a note, take a note, sort of like an unofficial ledger of those who've come and gone. Curious, I stepped closer to inspect the scraps of paper. Some were simple messages. John was here, or Sarah and Mike made it to the top. But my eyes caught on one poster, a missing person notice, weathered by time and rain. My breath hitched as I looked closer. It was me. Dated five years into the future, the paper showed a photograph remarkably like the one on my driver's license. My name was printed in bold, stark letters, missing. Last seen hiking near Stone Mountain. Contact if you have any information. A cold sweat broke out across my back. My hands trembled as I pulled my phone out to capture a picture of the poster, half expecting it to disappear like a figment of some surreal dream. But there it remained, in the frame of my screen, and in reality before me. Questions spiraled through my mind like a relentless whirlpool. Was this a prank? A cruel joke plotted by a friend or an enemy? But why? And how could they produce something so convincing? Yet, if it was a joke, why did my gut churn with such intense unease, as though reality itself had twisted askew? I left the clearing as quickly as I could, my pace now a hurried march. The rest of the trail felt longer, the mountain air denser, the forest no longer whispered its comforting lullabies. Instead, it seemed to close in on me like an imposing maze. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, took on an ominous tone. I pushed on, propelled by a desire to put as much distance as possible between me and that eerie clearing. When I finally emerged from the trail, I felt like I'd been spat out from another world. I threw my gear into the car and sped home, where I examined the photo I'd taken. The image on the screen was as unsettling as the paper itself, a ghostly harbinger of a future I didn't understand. Days turned into weeks, and the incident transformed into an unsettling memory, buried but never forgotten. I considered showing the photo to friends, to family, even to the police. But something stopped me each time the unsettling notion that some questions are better left unanswered. Still, the poster changed something fundamental in me. These days, when I hike, I steer clear of that specific trail, opting for paths that offer fewer questions and more peace of mind. Yet sometimes, when the night is still and sleep evades me, I find myself pondering that mysterious poster, a harbinger of an unspoken future. Could it be a twisted rip in the fabric of time? A prank? Or a warning? I may never know. And perhaps that uncertainty is the most unsettling part of it all. A mystery that trails behind me like an ever-present shadow, lurking just beyond the horizon of my understanding. The first time I heard it, my hands froze over my dinner plate, fork half raised. The sound cut through the usual evening quiet, a human scream, elongated and piercing. My heart raced. Instinct pulled me to my feet, but reason anchored me. It happened again, another scream, the sound filling the empty corners of my cabin. My neighbor had warned me, said it was the birds but a primal part of me buzzed with alarm. I had to know. Flashlight in hand, I ventured into the dark labyrinth of trees. Moonlight filtered through the canopy, casting shifting patterns on the ground. The forest seemed to breathe, and my footsteps sounded like an invasion. Then it happened. A scream so close I could almost feel the vibration in the air. I swung my flashlight toward the sound, half expecting to see a face twisted in anguish. 
Instead, a bird, a black silhouette against the dark sky, swooped from a branch and disappeared into the underbrush. More screams joined in, a cacophony that felt like an eerie choir. Birds? Mimicking human agony? My mind spun, juggling disbelief and the chilling reality. I watched as they fluttered from tree to tree, each scream indistinguishable from a human's. Yet, something was missing. No anguish, no pain. Just air funneled through feathers and beak. Eventually I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, I wrestled with what I had heard, what I had seen. Nature, as it turns out, is neither kind nor malevolent. It simply is. The birds screamed not out of sorrow, but because that's what they did, a chilling phenomenon without rhyme or reason. Days turned into weeks, and I found a new routine. I still heard the birds, their nightly screams a haunting lullaby that no longer robbed me of sleep. It became a part of my life, another element in the complex mosaic of the forest. I never found out why the birds scream, and maybe that's the point. In a world teeming with questions, not all answers bring comfort. Sometimes the enigma is more tolerable than the truth. And so I let the birds scream. They fill the night with sound, each cry an enigmatic note in the symphony of the forest. It's unsettling, yes, but it's also a reminder, a stark, unforgiving echo of life's complexities. And I listen. The first time I heard it, my hands froze over my dinner plate, fork half raised. The sound cut through the usual evening quiet, a human scream, elongated and piercing. My heart raced. Instinct pulled me to my feet, but reason anchored me. It happened again, another scream, the sound filling the empty corners of my cabin. My neighbor had warned me, said it was the birds, but a primal part of me buzzed with alarm. I had to know. Flashlight in hand, I ventured into the dark labyrinth of trees. Moonlight filtered through the canopy, casting shifting patterns on the ground. The forest seemed to breathe, and my footsteps sounded like an invasion. Then it happened. A scream so close I could almost feel the vibration in the air. I swung my flashlight toward the sound, half expecting to see a face twisted in anguish. Instead, a bird, a black silhouette against the dark sky, swooped from a branch and disappeared into the underbrush. More screams joined in, a cacophony that felt like an eerie choir. Birds? Mimicking human agony? My mind spun, juggling disbelief and the chilling reality. I watched as they fluttered from tree to tree, each scream indistinguishable from a human's. Yet, something was missing. No anguish, no pain. Just air funneled through feathers and beak. Eventually I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, I wrestled with what I had heard, what I had seen. Nature, as it turns out, is neither kind nor malevolent. It simply is. The birds screamed not out of sorrow, but because that's what they did, a chilling phenomenon without rhyme or reason. Days turned into weeks, and I found a new routine. I still heard the birds, their nightly screams a haunting lullaby that no longer robbed me of sleep. It became a part of my life, another element in the complex mosaic of the forest. I never found out why the birds scream, and maybe that's the point. In a world teeming with questions, not all answers bring comfort. Sometimes the enigma is more tolerable than the truth. And so, I let the birds scream. They fill the night with sound, each cry an enigmatic note in the symphony of the forest. It's unsettling, yes, but it's also a reminder, a stark, unforgiving echo of life's complexities. And I listen.
But for the past week, our hikes had gained an unexpected soundtrack. A second bark, echoing Stella's, but coming from an unseen source. Every time Stella barked at a squirrel, or sent a joyous hello into the wilderness, this other bark would respond. It was uncanny, a perfect mimic of Stella's own vocalizations, yet somehow hollow, as if coming from far away, or perhaps from somewhere much closer than I cared to think. Tonight was no different. As we stepped onto the familiar path, Stella let out a playful bark, and sure enough, the second bark replied. This phantom canine always seemed to be just out of sight, hiding behind a curtain of trees and leaves. I had considered every reasonable explanation, a neighbor's dog, an animal with a similar sounding call, even the playful acoustics of the forest. But the more I heard it, the less it sounded like any of those things. Tonight, my curiosity reached its boiling point. I decided to find out once and for all where this other bark was coming from. Come on, Stella, let's find your friend, I said, a note of forced cheerfulness in my voice. Stella looked up at me, ears perked, as if she too sensed that this hike was different. I led her off the main trail, following the direction from which the second bark seemed to emanate. Stella hesitated, then followed, her steps more cautious than usual. The second bark sounded again, closer this time, pulling us deeper into the woods. The sun was setting, and shadows stretched long fingers across the path, making the trees appear taller and more menacing. Stella barked, perhaps sensing my tension, and the second bark answered, now sounding not just like an echo, but like a distorted version of Stella's bark, as if heard through a broken speaker. The forest was darker now, and I flicked on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the gloom. I felt disoriented, as if the trees had rearranged themselves to confuse me. It was foolish to be here after dark, I realized. My gut screamed at me to turn back, but I needed to know. Just then, Stella growled, a low, rumbling sound I'd never heard her make. The fur on her back stood on end. My heart pounded in my chest as I swung my flashlight around, half expecting to catch a pair of eyes staring back at us. But there was nothing, only an impenetrable wall of darkness. That's when it hit me. The second bark had stopped. The forest was silent, save for my own breathing and the distant rustle of leaves. Whatever had been mimicking Stella was gone, or perhaps it had never been there at all. I looked down at Stella, who seemed as relieved as I was to retreat. As we made our way back to the trail, the normal sounds of the forest gradually returned. The chirping of crickets, the hoot of an owl, even Stella's own occasional bark. But the second bark remained absent, as if swallowed by the woods. We never heard it again after that night and our hikes returned to their peaceful routine. Yet the experience lingers at the back of my mind, a mystery without an answer. I still venture into the woods, drawn by their beauty and tranquility, but there's a cautiousness now, a heightened awareness. I listen more than I used to, attuned to the hidden life that teems just beyond the reach of sight and understanding. As for Stella, she still bounds ahead with joyful abandon, but I've noticed she sticks closer now, as if she too understands that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Sometimes I catch her pausing, ears perked, as if waiting for something, but whatever she's listening for remains silent, a haunting whisper that has vanished into the depths of the forest, leaving only questions in its wake. I had been exploring the dense woods for the weekend, a lone venture to satisfy my restless spirit. The well was not what I had expected to find. My plans involved wildlife photography and the simple joy of fire-cooked meals, not relics of human settlement deep in a place where even GPS feared to tread. 
I approached cautiously, the hairs on the back of my neck tingling with an instinctual caution. Nature had long reclaimed this space, but the well remained like a scar that refused to heal. The air was thick, and I felt the weight of a silence that seemed to have settled ages ago. Then came the voice. Help me. It was a whisper, a desperate plea spiraling up from the inky depths below. My blood ran cold. I strained my ears, wondering if it was a trick of the wind or an echo bouncing through the forest. Please, help me. There it was again, unmistakable this time, a voice tinged with anguish. My rational mind screamed at me. A voice from an ancient well, miles from any human habitation. Impossible. Yet my conscience, that stubborn internal compass, refused to let me walk away. Against better judgment, I rummaged through my backpack for my flashlight and rope. Knotting the rope securely around a sturdy tree, I shined the flashlight into the well. Nothing but an impenetrable darkness stared back, swallowing the beam as if mocking my feeble attempt to unveil its secrets. With a deep breath, I began my descent, hand over hand, each downward movement a commitment to the unknown. The walls of the well closed in, damp and claustrophobic, and the air grew colder as I plunged further into the dark. Finally, my feet touched solid ground. I clicked on the flashlight and scanned my surroundings. My heart sank. There was nothing there, no trapped animal, no lost hiker, just a small vacant underground chamber with walls of stone and earth. The reality of my situation hit me like a wave. I was alone, in an ancient well, chasing a voice that couldn't possibly exist. I felt foolish and unsettled, unnerved by the echoing silence that now filled the space. As I began my ascent, pulling myself up the rope, a chilling thought crawled into my mind. What if the voice wasn't coming from the bottom, but from somewhere above? The realization propelled me faster, my muscles aching as I neared the top. When I finally emerged from the well, gasping for air. I looked around frantically. The forest appeared the same, indifferent to my turmoil, but the weight of unseen eyes pressed upon me. I pulled up the rope, packed my gear, and without a backward glance, retreated from that haunted place. The hike back to camp was a blur, my thoughts a jumble of relief and apprehension. Had I imagined it all? A trick of acoustics, perhaps. But what about that insistent plea, so filled with raw emotion? I broke camp the following morning, cutting my trip short. As I made my way out of the forest, I realized that I was leaving with more than just photographs and memories. I was taking a piece of the forest's unsettling enigma with me, a riddle that would forever remain unsolved. I never returned to that well, never sought it out on later trips or on any maps. Some mysteries, I decided, are better left as they are. Unexplained echoes in the wilderness of both the world and the mind. Yet, the voice from the well has never left me, its plea lingering in quiet moments, forever raising questions that dare not be answered. We were pretty beat from the long drive, but we stayed up late hanging around the fire, having some beers and grilling hot dogs. It felt good to be out here disconnected from everything. The woods were so peaceful at night. At some point, Dana said she heard music playing faintly in the distance. We all quieted down and listened. Sure enough, we could make out the indistinct sounds of people laughing and singing along to guitar music. Must be another group's campsite nearby. Let's go crash their party, Tyler said. He was pretty buzzed by then. Yeah, I want to see who else is out here, Dana added. She looked a little creeped out by the distant music and wanted company. I shrugged and figured why not. 
we grabbed flashlights and started hiking through the dark trees toward the sounds. I felt sticks and rocks poking into my feet through my thin sneakers. As we walked deeper into the woods, the music got louder and more raucous, like a full-on party. We shouted a few, hellos, but no one ever answered back. The forest just seemed to swallow up our voices. We kept on toward the sound of singing and laughing, even though the hair on my arms was standing up. I couldn't see any distant campfire light or anything. Finally, we came stumbling into a little clearing. They must be just on the other side, Tyler said excitedly. But there was nothing. The music cut off abruptly, leaving just the normal nightwood sounds. No tents, coolers, picnic tables. Nothing to indicate a campsite had been there at all. That's bizarre. I know I heard people here, Dana said in a small voice. We all felt the creep factor rising. Let's get back to our site, I urged. We turned our flashlights back toward where I thought our camp was. But after 15 minutes of walking, there was no sign of it. We were well and truly lost. The laughter was long gone. It was dead quiet now, except for branches scratching and critters scurrying. Even our own campfire light had vanished. We wandered in the dark woods for what felt like hours, getting more turned around by the minute. Exhausted and freaked out, we took shelter under a rocky overhang as the first light of dawn started glowing through the trees. I don't know what was going on in these woods, but we sure as hell couldn't wait to get out of there. This was one camping trip I won't be forgetting any time soon. Cancun was a paradise of blue skies and even bluer waters. The ocean was its own world alive and whispering secrets through the currents. I'd spent the entire year looking forward to this snorkeling trip. My dad used to tell stories about how our ancestors were seafarers, explorers who mapped uncharted waters. I always felt a connection to the ocean that I couldn't explain, like a song whose lyrics I had forgotten, but whose melody stayed with me. On the third day, Armed with snorkeling gear and a waterproof camera, I took a boat trip to a secluded reef. The guide, Ricardo, assured me it was an extraordinary spot, a place where the sea unveiled its hidden beauty. As soon as I plunged into the water, I was in another realm. Schools of vividly colored fish danced around me. Corals stretched out like ancient cities, an underwater metropolis teeming with life. I lost track of time, mesmerized by the vibrant underworld. But as I swam farther from the other snorkelers, the scenery began to change. The water got darker, and the corals appeared older, their colors muted. I was about to turn back when something caught my eye, an object half buried in the sand below, its outlines too straight and angular to be a natural formation. Curiosity pulling me deeper, I dove down for a closer look. What I found stopped me cold. A statue, humanoid but not human, its features a surreal blend of aquatic and terrestrial elements. It looked ancient, the material worn away by countless tides. It was the plaque at its base that took my breath away, literally and figuratively. My family's last name was etched onto it, Mendoza. I blinked, half expecting the letters to rearrange themselves, to make this bizarre occurrence some kind of misreading. But they remained, a cold testament set in stone. I took photos, my hands trembling. I had to show this to someone. I had to have proof that this wasn't some sort of underwater mirage. I quickly swam back to the boat my heart pounding in a rhythm it had never known. When I showed Ricardo the pictures, he looked puzzled and then concerned. This isn't something I've seen before, and I've been guiding tours for over a decade. You sure about the location? 
I nodded, pointing it out on the laminated ocean map he had on board. Ricardo scratched his head. That's not a typical spot for tourists. Too many local legends about sea spirits and forgotten gods. The fishermen avoid it. Ignoring my heightened sense of dread, I pressed him for more information. But he shook his head, reluctant to indulge in what he called superstitious nonsense. For the remainder of the trip, I couldn't get the statue and its plaque out of my mind. Who had put it there? How long had it been in the ocean? What did it mean? When I returned home, I showed the photos to my family. They were fascinated, but equally baffled. My dad, always the history buff, tried to dig into our family archives but came up empty. There were gaps in our lineage, periods where records were either incomplete or missing. Looks like our ancestors were good at keeping secrets, he mused. Weeks later, long after the trip, was a collection of photos and memories. Strange things began to happen. I found myself increasingly restless, a peculiar type of insomnia that left me tossing and turning, the sound of waves echoing in my ears even in the dead of night. Then I started to dream, visions of vast oceanscapes, of ancient rituals, of murmured incantations that seemed to flow from the statue's chiseled lips. Each morning, I would wake exhausted, like I'd been on an endless nocturnal journey. The final straw was the night I woke up to find my bed soaked, as though I'd been submerged in water. The room smelled of salt and seaweed, like a shoreline after high tide. And there on my nightstand, sat a small shell, a type I had never seen before, its spirals forming a pattern eerily similar to the designs on the sunken statue's plaque. I booked a return trip to Cancun, this time alone. When I met Ricardo, I could see the unease in his eyes. You sure you want to go back there? I have to, was all I could say. As the boat neared the spot, my heart tightened in my chest. Donning my snorkeling gear, I plunged into the ocean, propelled by a force I couldn't deny. I reached the statue, its presence as unsettling as before. But now it felt like an unfinished chapter, conversation interrupted but not concluded. I took a piece of paper, a waterproof one, and a pencil from my gear. On the paper, I wrote my full name, then pressed it against the plaque, securing it with a small net bag usually used to collect underwater samples. Then I waited. It didn't take too long. The water around me began to churn, the sand swirling like a miniature storm. I felt a pull, not of the current, but something deeper, as if the ocean itself had gripped my soul. My vision blurred. And when it cleared, I was back on the boat, Ricardo staring down at me, his face pale as sea foam. We need to leave, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. As we sped back to shore, I looked at the photograph of the statue one last time, and then deleted it from my camera. Some mysteries, it seemed, demanded their own form of isolation, their secrets too heavy for the surface world. That night, in my hotel room, I found another shell on my pillow, identical to the first one, but this time it came with a note. Welcome home. I haven't gone snorkeling since, not because I'm afraid, but because I'm not sure what I'd be returning to, a world of coral and fish, or a lineage that stretches into the dark corners of the sea. And sometimes, when the night is still, and the moon casts its glow on the water's surface, I hear whispers, voices that beckon, that plead, that promise. They call to me from depths I can't fathom, asking me to reclaim a legacy that was submerged long before I was born. And I wonder, with equal parts dread and longing, what would happen if I answered.
The Transnational Express had always been a dream of mine, a cross-country train journey that zigzagged through small towns and big cities, offering panoramic views of the landscapes most people only saw in travel brochures. When work dried up and my apartment lease ended, it seemed like the universe was giving me a sign. So, with a one-way ticket and a duffel bag, I boarded the train and settled into my seat. A couple of hours into the journey, I discovered an old worn out paperback wedged into the seat pocket in front of me. No title, no author, just a yellowed cover that looked as though it had survived a few decades. Curiosity peaked, I flipped it open and began to read. The story was engaging from the get-go, featuring a protagonist named Alex, who had an uncanny number of similarities to me. Same age, same hometown, even the same peculiar birthmark on the right wrist. The sense of deja vu was amusing at first, but then, as I turned the pages, the amusement turned to disbelief. Every minor detail, every anecdote, mirrored my life. There were episodes I hadn't shared with anyone, private moments, embarrassments, triumphs. It was as if someone had rifled through my memories and penned them down, rebranding them as fiction. I scanned the train car, suddenly paranoid. Faces stared blankly out windows or were buried in books and screens. No one paid me any attention. Yet I felt horribly exposed, as though I'd found a hidden camera in a dressing room. Forcing myself to breathe, I decided to keep reading. I needed to know how deep the rabbit hole went. The story meandered through familiar events, then veered into unfamiliar territory. Here, the narrative split from my reality. In this alternate life, Alex had never boarded the Transnational Express. Instead, he stayed in his hometown, shackled to a job he loathed, embroiled in a doomed relationship. Page by page, the story unfolded into a cautionary tale, a life filled with regret and missed opportunities. I read about Alex's downward spiral with growing unease. The climactic sense was jarring, a tragic end involving a car accident, alcohol, and shattered dreams. I closed the book, my hands trembling. Was this some kind of sick joke? A warning? Restless, I roamed the train, passing through cars filled with families, solo travelers, and empty seats. When I reached the observation car, I found it deserted, except for an elderly woman seated by the window. She looked up as I entered, her eyes narrowing for a moment before widening in recognition. You've read the book, haven't you? She said, her voice tinged with an accent I couldn't place. What is that thing? I asked, holding up the yellowed paper back as though it were evidence in a trial. It's a glimpse, she replied. A glimpse of another path, another ending. But why me? Who wrote this? Some questions don't have answers, she said, staring past me at the blur of landscapes rushing by. Or perhaps they have too many to count. Is it a warning? I pressed seeking some thread of sense in this woven chaos. It's a gift, she said, meeting my gaze. Whether you take it as a warning or an inspiration is entirely up to you. I left the observation car, my mind a labyrinth of questions without exits. Back in my seat, I shoved the book into my duffel bag, burying it beneath clothes and toiletries. Yet it felt like it weighed a ton, pulling me toward an understanding that remained tantalizingly out of reach. The train journey continued, stops were made, passengers disembarked, new faces appeared. But the scenery outside felt like a backdrop to the storm of thoughts inside me. Could I take this fork in the road, so vividly outlined in the pages of a nameless book? On the final day of the journey, I awoke to find the seat pocket empty. The book I had returned had vanished. I rummaged through my bag, but it was gone, as if it had never existed. No one else on the train remembered seeing it, or had any knowledge of the elderly woman in the observation car. When the train pulled into the final station, I stepped onto the platform, my duffel bag slung over my shoulder. The air was different here, filled with a sense of potential. 
a vibrancy that felt miles away from the life I'd left behind. I hailed a cab and directed it to a local inn. As I checked in, the woman at the front desk handed me a form to fill out. New in town? She asked, her eyes friendly, her smile genuine. Yes, I said, grasping the pen and hesitating for just a moment before writing down my name. Not Alex, the name I'd been given, but a new one, a name of my choosing. As I signed, I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was the same time the accident would have happened, according to the book's narrative. The coincidence, or was it fate, sent a shiver down my spine. I collected my room key and headed upstairs. But as I turned the corner, I froze. At the far end of the hall, a door creaked open. And for a fleeting second, I thought I saw the elderly woman from the observation car step out her eyes meeting mine in a knowing glance. And then she was gone, the door clicking shut behind her. I stood there, a cold draft whispering down the corridor, caressing the birthmark on my wrist. I gripped the key in my hand, its jagged edges digging into my palm, as if urging me to unlock not just a room, but a life yet unwritten. And as I inserted the key into the lock, I wondered, would this door lead me to the story the book foretold, or to one of my own making? The lock clicked open. I stepped inside, leaving the door ajar behind me. I was never a fan of long-haul flights, hours confined in a metal tube surrounded by strangers. To pass the time, I usually toggled between in-flight movies and the digital tracker that displayed our plane's current location. On this particular international flight, I decided to check the tracker again, something to take my mind off the tightening muscles in my back. A quick glance at the screen and my eyes narrowed. We were way off course. According to the map, our plane was headed toward an island in the middle of the ocean. An island that I'm pretty sure wasn't even supposed to be there. Puzzled, I hit the call button for the flight attendant. When she arrived, I pointed at the screen. Is this thing accurate? I said. She leaned in to look. Oh, these trackers can be a little glitchy sometimes. Don't worry, the pilots know where we're going. Despite her reassurances, the sinking feeling in my gut persisted. I couldn't ignore the hard data staring back at me. We were heading into uncharted territory, and it seemed like I was the only one who cared. An hour passed, then two. The tracker showed us getting closer to the mysterious island, while the rest of the plane's occupants were either asleep or engrossed in their entertainment screens. I had to do something. I unbuckled my seatbelt and headed for the restroom, strategically located near the cockpit. Waiting for the perfect moment, I saw a flight attendant push a cart into the galley. I seized the opportunity, knocking softly on the cockpit door. One of the pilots opened it, a hint of annoyance in his eyes. Can I help you? I'm sorry for the interruption, I said quickly. But according to the in-flight tracker, we're heading toward an island that's not on any map? Is that a glitch or... The pilots exchanged glances. The tension in the cockpit was palpable. Come in, the second pilot said, ushering me inside. I stepped into the cockpit, the array of controls and screens glowing in the semi-darkness. The main navigation system confirmed what I'd seen on my tracker. We were off course, headed toward an anomaly. We've been trying to correct it, the first pilot said. The navigation system deviated on its own about two hours ago. Manual overrides aren't working. We're stuck on this trajectory. Shouldn't we inform the passengers? I asked, my voice tinged with urgency. And say what? That we're flying blind toward an island that doesn't exist? The second pilot shook his head. 
Panic is the last thing we need. For a brief moment, I contemplated rushing out, alerting everyone, forcing the issue. But the potential chaos held me back. What good would it do? Look, said the first pilot, if you have any ideas on how to fix this, we're all ears. Otherwise, please return to your seat. We're doing everything we can. Resigned, I exited the cockpit, closing the door behind me. I returned to my seat, eyes flicking back to the tracker. Closer and closer we moved toward the Phantom Island, its outline growing more distinct. The flight continued in its eerie silence, the tension in my body building with each passing minute. And then it happened. The plane began to descend. Seatbelt signs flashed on and the cabin crew prepared for landing. We were committed now, come what may. As the wheels touched down on a makeshift runway, I stared out of the window. The island was real, its terrain lush and untamed. We taxied to a stop, the engines winding down, the weight of the unknown settling over us. The cabin door opened, stairs deployed, and we stepped out, passengers and crew alike, into the island's embrace. There were no signs of human life, no structures, no reception committees, just wilderness stretching out in every direction, and an ocean whose horizon held no promise of rescue. We had landed on an uncharted island, a place that defied maps and logic, carried here by a plane that refused to obey its pilots. Where we were, why we were here, and what it meant those questions hovered in the thick, humid air, unanswered. Days turned into weeks. Rescue never came. We adapted, survival outweighing understanding. The island became home, its inexplicable presence a riddle interwoven into the fabric of our new reality. The outside world faded into an abstraction, as distant as the stars that watched over us each night. The flight that vanished off the radar the passengers who disappeared into thin air, the plane that went where it shouldn't, all became the stuff of headlines, then theories, then myths. But for us, it became life. A life off course, off map, on an island that didn't exist until it did. The Airbnb was a quaint little cottage, tucked away in the rural backroads, the kind of place that promised a reprieve from the clamor of city life. The reviews were stellar, the pictures inviting. When Emma and I arrived, it was even more charming in person, a cozy living room, antique furniture, and an atmosphere thick with rustic allure. We were about to congratulate ourselves on finding this hidden gem, when Emma, made an observation. Hey, have you noticed something off about the mirrors? I looked around. She was right. Each mirror in the cottage was either covered with cloth or turned to face the wall. It wasn't just one or two. It was all of them. From the bathroom to the bedroom to even a small hand mirror that we found in a drawer. That's a bit weird, I admitted feeling a pinch of unease. Emma pulled out her phone. Maybe it's a cultural thing or some rural superstition? Should we ask the host? Before she could dial, I suggested, eh, let's not make a big deal out of it. People have their quirks, especially out here. She nodded, but I could tell she wasn't entirely convinced. Nevertheless, we pushed the mirror issue to the back of our minds and focused on enjoying the evening. We made dinner, watched a movie on my laptop, and eventually retreated to the bedroom. The cottage had no Wi-Fi and spotty cell reception, isolating us from the world outside. It should have been freeing, but as the night deepened, the absence of mirrors started to take on a weight, invisible yet increasingly palpable. We crawled into bed and I turned off the lights. In the dark, the mirror issue resurfaced in my mind now a gnawing concern. 
The room was pitch black, save for the sliver of moonlight that sneaked through the curtains, casting elongated shadows on the walls. Then I heard it, a faint, almost indiscernible scratching sound, like fingernails against wood, coming from the direction of the covered mirror. I shot a glance at Emma, her eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. You heard that too? She whispered. Yeah, I said, my voice trembling despite myself. The scratching sound continued, rhythmically persistent. I weighed the options in my head, ignore it and hope it goes away, or confront it and risk discovering something we'd rather not know. A cloud must have moved because the room darkened even further, amplifying the tension. Enough was enough. With a surge of adrenaline, I sprang out of bed and flipped on the light switch. The scratching stopped instantly. My eyes darted to the mirror covered with an embroidered cloth. I felt a mix of dread and resolve as I approached it, my hands shaking as I reached for the cloth. Wait, Emma said, her voice tinged with apprehension. I paused, locking eyes with her. In that moment, we both understood the risks of unveiling the unknown. I let my hand drop, stepping back. We should leave it alone, she said, a mixture of relief and lingering curiosity in her eyes. Agreed, I replied, unable to mask my own relief. We spent the rest of the night in a tense, sleepless vigil, the covered mirror a silent sentinel in the room. Morning couldn't come soon enough. As the first rays of sunlight filtered through the curtains, we packed up and left without looking back. Our host sent us a message later, asking how our stay was. I hesitated before typing out a non-committal reply about the cottage being lovely and quaint. There was no mention of mirrors. The experience remained a puzzle piece that refused to fit, an anomaly in an otherwise idyllic getaway. The questions hovered in our minds, but neither of us wanted to probe further. Some mysteries, we concluded, are better left covered. Their truths turned away to face the wall. The city was a labyrinth of narrow alleys and sprawling plazas, soaked in a history that I could only appreciate through the lens of a camera. Every corner seemed steeped in a story that I couldn't fully grasp. I didn't speak the language, relying on fractured phrases and Google Translate to get by. Restaurants, museums, shopping, simple transactions, aided by the ubiquity of the universal language of currency but a deeper understanding of the place and its people eluded me. Then came that first night. Jet-lagged and restless, I wandered into the old district, away from the well-trodden paths of fellow tourists. Midnight approached. The chimes of a distant clock tower marked the hour, a dozen resonant dings echoing in the stillness. I stumbled upon a hole-in-the-wall bar sparsely populated by locals. The moment I stepped inside, something shifted. The bartender spoke, and instead of hearing unintelligible sounds, I understood him perfectly. What will you have? He asked. I answered fluently, ordering a drink in a language I didn't know I spoke. The transformation was jarring. I felt like I'd been granted access to a secret layer of the world, one that had always been there right beyond the veil of comprehension. Conversations around me became transparent, people discussing politics, love, and the trials of everyday life. Words flowed from my mouth effortlessly, my tongue deftly navigating the syntax and grammar as if I had spoken the language all my life. My newfound ability persisted. I left the bar, wandered through the labyrinthine streets, and found myself among late night benders and night owls. I conversed with ease, each interaction deepening my connection to the city and its inhabitants. But I also felt like an imposter 
trespassing in a realm that wasn't meant for me. As the sky started to brighten, a sense of dread settled in. Would my newfound ability disappear as mysteriously as it had arrived? A clock somewhere struck four, and just like that, the words became muffled, opaque. My midnight fluency had evaporated, leaving me with nothing but an aftertaste of what had been. I returned to my hotel room, a profound sense of loss mingling with wonder. For the rest of my trip, every night at the stroke of midnight, I found myself immersed in this alternate reality, a fluent stranger in a land that felt increasingly like home. And each morning the spell broke, pushing me back into the sphere of the outsider. I spoke to no one about it. Who would believe me? Who could make sense of this bizarre circadian talent? I took no videos, snapped no audio clips. It felt wrong to document what I couldn't explain. On my last night, I stayed in. I watched the city through my window, the streets slowly emptying, the sounds of a language I could temporarily call my own, filling the air as the clock tower struck midnight. A final evening of fluency, before boarding a plane, to a place where words wouldn't evade me. I left the city, carrying its alleys and midnight conversations in the inner chambers of my memory, an experience bound to time and place. I still travel, exploring other foreign lands and other tongues, but every time the clock strikes midnight, wherever I am, I'm taken back to those winding streets, to that hole-in-the-wall bar, to the people I spoke with in a language that only truly became mine in the shadowy realm between one day and the next. The hiking trail through the forest was familiar. Each bend, each fork, leading deeper into the woods, held a nostalgia for Maya and me. We'd hiked it dozens of times, our love story punctuated by the footfalls on this very path. It was a year ago on this trail that we'd lost a shoe. A ridiculous thing, really. Maya's right hiking boot had somehow gotten loose and fallen off. We looked everywhere, but we never found it. A small loss, but it became one of our go-to funny stories. So, when we came across a lone shoe sitting squarely in the middle of the path, laughter was our first reaction. Hey, look, someone else decided to donate to the forest, Maya chuckled. I bent down to get a closer look. No way. It's a right boot, size 7. This is your missing shoe. She raised an eyebrow. Come on, what are the odds? It's been a year. I picked it up, brushing off the leaves and dirt. It looked almost new, its material free from rot or wear, the brand and design matching the pair she used to have. This is too weird, Maya said, taking the shoe from my hands. We looked at each other, the humor dissipating like mist before the sun. This didn't make sense. We lost that shoe miles away from this spot, and the condition, it should have weathered a year of forest life. Let's get going, I suggested, suddenly eager to leave this peculiar find behind us. We walked in uneasy silence, the trees seemed to loom a little taller their shadows stretching dark fingers across the trail. Birds chatted overhead, but their songs sounded discordant, almost mocking. When we reached the spot where we'd lost the shoe a year ago, we paused. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, just a bend in the trail framed by oak and pine, sunlight filtering through in dappled patches. Look, Maya whispered, pointing to the ground. Right there, where she'd lost her boot, was a fresh footprint. A right footprint, its shape mirroring that of the lone boot we'd found. A shiver crawled up my spine. It felt like the forest itself was watching us, 
that our movements were echoed by something we couldn't see or understand. The eeriness clung to us, the silence broken only by our hurried steps. Finally, we reached the end of the trail, the car park a welcome sight. Without speaking, we packed our gear into the car and drove off. The forest receded in the rear view mirror, but its unsettling memory lingered. Days passed, the shoe sat in our garage, an enigma neither of us wanted to touch. Maya suggested we throw it away, but I hesitated. It was as though discarding it would be an admission of something too strange to articulate. And then, one morning, it was gone. The shoe had vanished from the garage, leaving an empty space on the shelf. Maya shrugged it off, saying maybe one of us had moved it and forgotten. I wanted to believe her. I really did. Yet the absence gnawed at me, as if the missing shoe had become a metaphor for an unanswered question, a puzzle missing its final piece. Weeks later, we returned to the forest. An unspoken agreement hung between us to avoid talking about the shoe or the footprint. We just wanted a normal hike to reclaim the sanctuary this trail had once been for us. But halfway in, we found it again. A lone right boot, size seven, placed neatly in the center of the path. The same brand, the same design, impossibly new. This time, we didn't stop. We didn't discuss it. We quickened our pace until we were almost running, each step an affirmation of our desire to leave this bewildering mystery behind. As we exited the forest, a chill washed over me. I looked back one last time. The trees stood like sentinels, their branches swaying gently in the wind, or perhaps in farewell. We never returned to that trail, but sometimes when we're alone in the silence of our thoughts, I catch Maya looking at her hiking boots, lined up neatly by the door. And I know she's wondering, as I am, whether that other shoe is still out there on the trail, waiting for the moment we dare return, and wondering what might happen if we do. I had dreamed of this moment ever since I was a child. The chance to finally see the legendary Loch Ness Monster with my own eyes. And now, here I stood on the pebbled shores of the iconic Loch Ness, wrapped in an early morning mist that curled off the glassy water. I had risen hours before dawn, too anxious and excited to sleep through the night before my long-awaited quest. As the first rays of sun peeked over the rolling green hills, I scanned the expansive loch with abated breath. A quiet stillness hung in the air, interrupted only by the occasional lap of water against the rocks. And then, suddenly, a great rush of movement. A flock of birds erupted from the trees, squawking in panic. My pulse quickened, and I stared intently at the spot where they had taken flight. Had something disturbed them below the surface? Churning water appeared, too forceful to be caused by any ordinary fish or eel. My heart pounded as the massive shape of some underwater creature twisted just below the water's surface. Its immense serpentine body undulated with surprising grace given its enormous size. I could scarcely believe my eyes overwhelmed by the ancient beast of legend and lore coming to life before me. Slowly, carefully, the creature turned toward the shore where I stood, immobilized in awe. As it approached, its details came into focus, a long arched neck extending from its body, the head small and rounded compared to its girth. Sunlight glittered off dark scales in hues of green and steel gray. Though terrified, I also felt profound privilege to encounter this mythic animal in the flesh. The massive head rose from the water, beady eyes locking onto mine briefly 
as if taking stock of who had intruded upon its ancient realm. I dared not move a muscle, feeling as though I was glimpsing a piece of the past, a creature that time had forgotten. With a powerful flick of its muscular tail, the monster slowly submerged again into the loch's shadowy depths. I lingered long after it had gone, overwhelmed and hoping to catch one last look. Though the beast did not resurface, I knew that I would treasure that magical moment on the shore forever. The Loch Ness Monster was real, and I felt honored to have seen it, if only for a moment. The North Sea was known for its treacherous waters and unpredictable weather, but for us sailors, it was also a source of livelihood. Our ship was a sturdy vessel that had seen many voyages, but nothing could have prepared us for that day. The morning started off calm, the sea reflecting the pale blue of the sky. We were making good time, the wind filling our sails as we navigated through familiar waters. But as the day wore on, a sense of unease settled over the crew. The waters grew darker, and the air became thick with tension. Whispers among the crew spoke of ancient legends, tales of a monstrous creature that lurked in the depths, waiting for its next victim. I dismissed these as mere superstitions, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that we were being watched. As evening approached, the waters began to churn. Massive waves rocked our ship, and a deep rumbling echoed from the depths below. And then, without warning, they appeared. Massive tentacles, each one the size of a ship's mast, rose from the water, reaching for the sky. The crew was thrown into chaos. Men shouted orders, trying to navigate away from the looming threat. But it was too late. The tentacles wrapped around our ship, pulling it closer to the abyss. The wood creaked and groaned under the immense pressure, and I could hear the terrified screams of my crewmates. I clung to the mast, my eyes fixed on the monstrous appendages that threatened to pull us under. And then, from the depths, it emerged. A colossal eye, black and unblinking, stared at us its gaze filled with ancient malice. The world seemed to stand still in that moment. Time lost all meaning as we were held in the Kraken's grasp. And then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature released us, the tentacles retracted into the depths, and the sea calmed once more. We were left adrift, our ship damaged but still afloat. The crew was shaken, many injured, but miraculously, everybody was alive. For some reason, we had faced the Kraken and lived to tell the tale. The rest of our journey was a blur. We made our way back to port, our ship a testament to our harrowing encounter. Many dismissed our tales as the rambling of traumatized sailors, but we knew the truth. The North Sea still calls to us, its waters filled with promise and peril. But we sail with caution, always aware of the ancient terror that lurks below, waiting for its next prey. The ancient ruins of Delphi perched high on the slopes of Mount Parnassus have long been a place of pilgrimage and wonder. Known as the center of the world in ancient Greek religion, it was said to be protected not just by the gods, but by creatures of majestic power, the griffins. I had always been fascinated by Greek mythology and the tales of these magnificent beings with the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. They were among my favorite stories. So when an opportunity arose to join an archaeological expedition to Delphi, I leapt at the chance. 
our team was searching for remnants of ancient rituals and artifacts. Days turned into weeks, and while we uncovered many fascinating relics, there was no sign of the griffins. That was until one evening, as the sun cast a golden hue over the ruins. I had wandered away from the main excavation site and found myself in a secluded grove. In its center stood a stone pedestal, and atop it, a gleaming golden object. As I approached, I realized it was a beautifully crafted beak, sharp and gleaming like a sword. Suddenly, a shadow passed overhead. I looked up to see two massive griffins, their golden beaks matching the one on the pedestal, circling above. Their eyes, fierce and proud, locked on to mine, and for a moment, I felt the weight of their scrutiny, as if they were assessing my very soul. With a powerful flap of their wings, they descended, landing gracefully on either side of the pedestal. They regarded me with a mix of curiosity and caution, their majestic presence filling the grove. I slowly approached the pedestal, placing my hand on the golden beak. A rush of images flooded my mind, rituals, ceremonies, and the griffins standing guard, protecting the sacred site and its treasures from invaders. As the vision faded, I found myself back in the grove, the griffins still watching me. With a nod of their heads, as if acknowledging a shared understanding, they spread their wings and soared into the sky, disappearing into the setting sun. I returned to the camp, the golden beak in hand, and shared my encounter with the team. While many were skeptical, our lead archaeologist, well versed in the myths, believed. He spoke of the griffins as guardians, protectors of the divine and the sacred. The discovery of the beak was hailed as a significant find, a tangible link to the legends of old. But for me, it was more than just an artifact. It was a reminder of the magic and mystery that still dwells in our world, guarded by beings of ancient power and majesty. The old clock on the barn wall clanged midnight, just as I hauled the last musty bale up into the hayloft. I paused to wipe beads of sweat off my brow and take a deep, satisfying breath. The worn wooden walls creaked gently in the night breeze, mingling with the faint moos of Bessie settling down for bed. Outside, the farm was swallowed by inky darkness, not even starlight pierced through the blanket of clouds tonight. After latching the heavy barn doors, I headed back home, anxious to put my feet up. But a prickle shivered up my spine before I'd gone even 20 paces. Something in the air felt off. The hairs on my neck stood at attention. The farm was as silent as a graveyard, not even the whisper of the wind through the cornfields. I froze in my tracks at the sound of panicked bleeding near the pasture. Old Margaret, the sheep, crying for help. I grabbed my flashlight and sprinted over, sweeping the feeble light across the field. It glinted off glassy eyes and tousled wool as the sheep bumped each other in distress. There, the light fixed on a horror hovered over Margaret's limp body. My heart seized at the sight of its emaciated frame, nothing but leathery hide clinging to jagged bones, coarse fur sprouting in mangy patches across its haggard body. But most terrifying was the row of spikes jutting from its arched, snarling back. The creature's head snapped toward me, glowing crimson eyes meeting mine. Blood dripped from jagged fangs bared in a gruesome sneer. Every childhood nightmare about the chupacabra sprang to life before my eyes. I stumbled back as it unleashed an ungodly screech that rattled my bones. Those hellish eyes bored into mine a moment more, 
and then the beast disappeared like a wisp of smoke into the darkness between heartbeats. I ran to Margaret, but it was too late. Her wool was matted with blood where the chupacabra had fed. Childhood myths warped into flesh and blood before my eyes, into razor fangs that had claimed another innocent life under the cloak of night. The pale morning sun filtered through the tall pines as I laced up my hiking boots and prepared for a day on the trails. I had backpacked deep into the Cascades to get away from the noise and stress of everyday life. Out here, I could be fully immersed in nature. Slipping on my pack, I consulted my map and set off down the trail. I hiked for several miles, the only sounds being the wind rustling leaves, and my boots crunching on the forest floor. At a clearing, I stopped to sip some water and take in the view. Snow-capped peaks jutted up in the distance. All was tranquil. After stowing my water bottle, I stood and stretched my legs. Just then, a loud crack reverberated through the trees ahead. I froze. Another crack boomed accompanied by heavy bipedal footsteps. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. Gripping my walking stick, I called out nervously, Hello? The footsteps grew louder, branches snapping like gunshots. This was no bear or deer. It sounded like a person. But how? I was miles from civilization. Fear and fascination dueled within me. I wanted to flee, but my legs were paralyzed. The footsteps thudded closer, and suddenly, a massive creature stepped out from the pines. My heart nearly stopped. Standing before me was a huge, hair-covered beast, walking upright on two legs. It stood at least eight feet tall, with broad shoulders and muscular limbs. The face was obscured by a mane of reddish-brown hair, except for two dark, intelligent eyes gazing back at me. We stared at each other, neither of us moving a muscle. My mind reeled, unable to accept what I was seeing. Bigfoot. It couldn't be real, and yet here it was. The biggest discovery in natural history living and breathing. Slowly, Bigfoot leaned forward, eyes piercing into me with uncanny awareness. It was analyzing me as I tried fruitlessly to analyze it. I was in awe, overwhelmed by this mythical beast made real. Then, calmly, it turned and sauntered back into the ancient forest. I watched, dumbstruck, until it disappeared like a ghost. I hurried down the trail, hands shaking. I knew my claims would be ridiculed and dismissed, but I didn't need validation. My reality had been irrevocably shifted. I had witnessed something beyond explanation, a glimpse into the unknown. Somewhere out there, Bigfoot still dwells, a humbling reminder that nature still holds secrets beyond our grasp. I will forever cherish the brief wonder of our encounter. Algonquin Park in Ontario was a place of solace for me. As a child, my family would often visit, and I would lose myself in the vastness of its woods. As an adult, I continued the tradition, often taking solo trips to reconnect with nature. But one autumn trip shifted my perspective forever. I had planned a five-day hike, charting a course that would take me through some of the park's less-traveled areas. The first couple of days were peaceful, 
filled with the vibrant colors of fall and the gentle sounds of the forest. On the third day, as I was making my way through a particularly dense section of woods, I began to hear it, a soft, rhythmic crunching of leaves. At first, I thought it was just the wind or perhaps a small animal, but as the hours went on, the sound persisted, always behind me, always just out of sight. That evening, as I set up camp near a quiet stream, I caught a fleeting glimpse of something in the periphery of my vision. A large figure, covered in fur, moving swiftly between the trees. I tried to dismiss it as a trick of the light, or perhaps fatigue playing tricks on my mind. But as night fell, the sounds grew closer. The once gentle crunching of leaves now felt ominous echoing through the stillness of the night. I lay in my tent, flashlight in hand, listening intently. Every so often, I would hear a soft grunt or a low growl, sending shivers down my spine. In the early hours of the morning, curiosity overcame fear. I cautiously unzipped my tent and peered out. The moon was high in the sky, casting a silvery glow over the forest. And there, on the edge of the clearing, stood a massive creature, its fur glistening in the moonlight. It looked at me with curious eyes, its gaze neither threatening nor friendly, just observing. We locked eyes for what felt like an eternity. And then, with a grace that belied its size, it turned and disappeared into the woods. The next day, I found large footprints near my campsite confirming that my encounter had been real. I decided to cut my trip short, feeling both awed and unnerved by what I had witnessed. As I made my way back to the park's entrance, I crossed paths with an elder from a local tribe. I shared my experience, and he listened intently. He spoke of the Sasquatch, a guardian of the woods, a creature that his people had known of for generations. He told me I was fortunate that such encounters were rare and were often seen as a sign, a reminder that we are but guests in these ancient woods, and there are beings far older and more mysterious than us that call it home. I left Algonquin Park with a newfound respect for its mysteries. The vast forests, with their towering trees and hidden trails, were more than just a place of beauty. They were a realm where legends walked, always one step ahead, always watching. The Slavic woods have always been a place of mystery and folklore. As a child, my grandmother would tell me tales of creatures and spirits that dwelled within its depths. But the one story that always sent shivers down my spine was that of Baba Yaga. One summer, driven by youthful curiosity and a touch of bravado, I decided to venture deep into the woods to see if the legends were true. I had heard whispers of a peculiar hut that stood on chicken legs, and I was determined to find it. After days of wandering, I stumbled upon a clearing. In its center stood a wooden hut its architecture bizarre and unsettling. It stood on two massive chicken legs, and as I approached, the hut began to spin, its windows and doors shifting and changing places. Gathering my courage, I called out, Hut, hut, turn your back to the forest and your front to me. To my astonishment, the hut obeyed, setting down with its door facing me. I cautiously stepped inside and was met with an even stranger sight. The interior was filled with odd trinkets and herbs hanging from the ceiling, and there, in the center of the room, sat an old crone, her skin wrinkled and her teeth made of iron. It was Baba Yaga. She looked me up and down, her gaze sharp and calculating. What brings a young one like you to my abode? She cackled. Swallowing my fear, I replied, I wanted to see if the legends were true. Baba Yaga laughed, 
a sound that was both eerie and mesmerizing. You have spirit, she said. But be warned, not all who enter my hut leave unscathed. We spoke for what felt like hours. She told me tales of the forest, of its spirits and creatures, and of her own ancient powers. I listened, captivated by her stories and the world she painted. As dawn approached, Baba Yaga looked out of her window. It's time for you to leave, she said, her voice softer now. But remember, the woods are a place of magic and mystery. Respect them and they will respect you. I nodded, thanking her for her wisdom. As I stepped out of the hut, it began to spin once more. And when I looked back, it had vanished leaving only the whispering trees behind. I returned to my village with a newfound respect for the legends of my people. Baba Yaga, the fearsome witch of the woods, had shown me a glimpse of a world beyond our understanding, a world where magic and reality intertwined. Autumn in Sleepy Hollow carries a distinct chill, a foreboding promise of what's to come. The leaves rustle underfoot, and the air grows crisp as the sun dips below the horizon. It was on such an evening that I found myself walking along the winding roads of this eerie town, shrouded in legends and whispered tales. The moon hung low, casting long shadows as I followed the path that led me to the bridge crossing the Pocantico River. It was there that I first heard the ominous sound of hooves approaching, distant but unmistakable. The night seemed to hold its breath as the echoes drew nearer, and I found myself transfixed. The creature of folklore, the headless horseman, was said to roam these very roads. I'd heard the stories, of course, but like any sensible person, I had dismissed them as mere tales spun to entertain and frighten. But as the thunderous hoofbeats grew louder, doubt gnawed at me. Suddenly, he emerged from the shadows, a monstrous silhouette atop a black steed. I could feel the ground tremble with each pounding step as the horseman drew closer. His form was indistinct, obscured by the inky blackness of the night. What struck terror into my very soul was the absence where a head should be. A fiery pumpkin perched upon his shoulders, its ghastly grin casting an eerie glow upon the surroundings. The sight of it, hovering in midair, seemed unnatural, like some unholy magic brought to life. In that brief moment, I understood the stories were no mere flights of fancy. I dared not move for fear of drawing the horseman's attention. The legend spoke of his penchant for seeking vengeance, and I had no intention of being the object of his ire. Instead, I stood there, rooted to the spot, my heart pounding in my chest as he thundered past me, the malevolent specter of Sleepy Hollow. The wind whistled through the trees as he galloped into the night, his fiery pumpkin casting an eerie glow that slowly faded into the distance. I watched until the last vestiges of the headless horseman disappeared, leaving behind an unsettling silence. I cannot explain what I witnessed that night, nor do I wish to. But this much I know, the legends of Sleepy Hollow are not to be taken lightly. The Headless Horseman is no mere tale to be dismissed. He is a presence that lingers in the shadows, a reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. And as I stood there in the moonlit darkness, I couldn't help but wonder if there were other creatures, equally as sinister, lurking in the obscure corners of this world. In Sleepy Hollow, the line between folklore and reality had blurred, leaving me with a chilling uncertainty that would haunt me for the rest of my days. Amidst the crumbling remnants of ancient Greece, where history's echoes whispered through time, 
a haunting presence lingered, a gorgon named Medusa. Her dread-inducing visage, adorned with writhing snakes for hair, awaited those who dared to venture near, for her petrifying gaze could turn the bravest of souls into lifeless stone. My encounter with this terrifying legend left me with a chilling sense of the macabre. It was within the shadowed corridors of a Greek ruin, where the stones bore witness to the passage of centuries, that I came upon Medusa's lair. The legends of the Gorgon had always filled me with a sense of foreboding, and now, as I ventured deeper into the labyrinthine passageways, I could feel the weight of her dark tail pressing down upon me. The ancient stones seemed to groan beneath the weight of history as I pressed on, my footsteps echoing in the eerie silence. The air was thick with the scent of age and decay, and the very atmosphere seemed to tremble with an unnatural tension. And then I saw her, a monstrous figure, her face obscured by a veil of shadow, her hair writhing like serpents in the dim light. It was Medusa, the Gorgon of Greek mythology, a creature whose gaze could bring death by transformation. As I stood frozen in terror, I watched as she moved with a sinister grace, her serpentine hair hissing with a deadly intent. Her eyes, hidden behind a shroud of darkness, exuded a malevolence that chilled me to the bone. The legend spoke of Medusa's power to turn those who met her gaze into solid stone, their bodies forever frozen in a grotesque mockery of life. Her curse was said to be an abomination, a punishment for her beauty and the arrogance of men who sought to possess her. I dared not meet her eyes, for the consequences of such an encounter were too ghastly to contemplate. I could feel her presence, her malevolent aura, as she moved closer, her serpentine hair writhing with anticipation. With a shudder, I turned and fled from the ruins, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew that I had come face to face with a force that transcended human understanding, a creature of myth and legend whose power was both horrifying and undeniable. This all happened when I was a kid. I was spending the weekend at my mom's house. My parents were separated, and I woke up one morning and watched some cartoons in her room while she slept. Eventually, I turned the TV off and went downstairs to make a bowl of cereal. I sat down at the table, which was about 10 feet from the open basement door. As I was eating, I heard my mom call me very loudly from the basement. The only things down there were a washing and drying machine and a toilet. I walked over to the door and peeked down there, and it was pitch black. That's when I remembered that my mom was asleep upstairs and hadn't come past me at all. So I freaked out, ran upstairs to her room, and sure enough, she was there asleep. There was no way that it could have been her, and it was just us in the house. The apartment gave me off, strange, and creepy vibes. My mom and I and a few other people all hated the feeling that you would get in the basement and the back room upstairs would give off very negative energy. Every time you went in there, you would start feeling kind of sad and very alert. She never used that room. It only had a couple of boxes in it for the five or so years that she lived there. Has anyone else had similar experiences? So I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. My family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences and then I'll get to the main story. First, our house was three stories with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. 
The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear somebody walking around in the office at night, sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally I'd hear talking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and that the toilet and water running was just faulty pipes. Maybe on the pipes, but no one was ever awake during the other things. Second, there would be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. There was like a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress pacing. My parents just said it was the shadow of somebody outside. We were on a hill overlooking all of our neighbors. I don't know how they thought this was possible. Third, I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music. I heard the banging really loudly, so loudly that it shook the room. Then the locked door swung open and I heard a scream. My parents said it was just my brother pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyway, on to the main event. My brother's about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at home with my parents and I. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there, but I wanted a big room. So when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room and eventually they caved and let me have it. I moved all of my stuff downstairs, painted it and everything. I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day and he casually says, watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked as obviously he was kidding, right? My whole family besides me never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off. I figured he was probably trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over and we were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom, laughing and stuff like that. She had to go to the bathroom, so she closes the door and I was just kind of zoning out. All of a sudden she goes, that's not funny. I asked her what she meant as I hadn't done anything. She said that she heard somebody laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out and I assumed that my brother put her up to it since she liked my brother. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mom, but I don't hear anything. I get out and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl giggle and then, are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but nobody's there. I checked the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm. So nobody could have come or gone through there without everyone knowing. I run upstairs and my mom is pissed that I set off the alarm and I told her what just happened. She then told me that my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but that it was nothing. I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He said he was kidding because, quote, you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and that's when he got legitimately creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl. I never saw her, but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors. I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today to ask me about this. He asked me if I was sure that I never tried to scare him by laughing, and I told him no. He got uncomfortable. I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted.
Back in 2014 to 2015, I was in high school and living with my parents. My parents were heavy on Christianity growing up, so I was raised going to church two times a week. My mom is extremely spiritual as well. Anyway, for years, my mom kept telling everybody that there was a lot of spiritual warfare that was going on in our house. Everybody in my family just thought she was crazy, but I strongly believe that it was true. My sister started going down the wrong path. My dad was apparently cheating on my mom for years, things like that. My parents started noticing some weird type of feces in our basement window wells. So one night, my mom asked me to help her find out what it was by going into the basement with the lights off and only using a flashlight. We went down there and were quietly waiting to see if we could figure out what it was, when all of a sudden we heard a whisper that was so loud, it almost felt like it was coming from a surround sound speaker. It was almost as if somebody came right up into both of our ears and whispered. It immediately sent chills down my whole body, and my mom too. We both froze for a second, and my mom said, What was that? Was that you? And I said, No, what was that? We both bolted up the stairs screaming, and we refused to go back down that night. My dad tried to say that we were just crazy and hearing things. I've never felt so uncomfortable and violated in my entire life. Something definitely whispered into our ears, but we couldn't make out what it had said. Still to this day, thinking about it freaks me out. Since then, my parents divorced and sold the house. Growing up, I had experienced a few strange things in that house, and my sisters did as well. Sometimes we would hear what almost sounded like a phone vibrating in the basement, but we couldn't ever figure out where it was coming from. It happened multiple times in the span of five years. I truly believe that there was a demonic entity messing with my family. I want to start this off by saying that I live in my mom's basement. Many people have said that they think it's haunted. Weird things have happened, like the washer turning on by itself, and sometimes even clothes appearing folded when they hadn't been folded previously. That's in the back room, though there's a larger main part that I live in. My bed and TV are set up where our pool table used to be placed when I was younger. In the middle of the night, when everyone else in the house was asleep, I used to hear people playing pool, so that area is no stranger to spirits. When I first moved down there around two months ago, I woke up to a dark figure standing a few feet away from me. It didn't seem threatening, it was just a little weird. I've also had other paranormal experiences. I don't know if they're related to the entities in the basement or what, but I guess I'll share them here too. For instance, yesterday, my YouTube showed numerous profile pictures that weren't mine, but only on my Apple TV and only on the top corner icon when I would click on the profile. It would show my normal one, which is just the standard issued one. But then on the Apple TV, all these other ones appeared. I just stared at it for a minute, confused, then got up to look at the picture and it had something to do with God. I couldn't really read it because of how small the icon was, but it seemed to be some type of Bible verse. Then before my eyes, the profile picture changed again to what looked like a picture of Jesus. So seeing this, I ran to my computer figuring somebody was on my account and I should probably change my password. But that's when I discovered that the icon on my account there was totally normal. No one knew had logged into my account and there were only three devices on that account, my computer, my Apple TV, and my Xbox. So I once again looked back at the TV and the icon was now different. This time I could actually read it. 
It said, the power of Christ compels you. This slightly shook me to my core, and I ran back to my computer to change my password. Eventually, the profile icon went back to normal on its own a few hours later, which was also somehow slightly alarming. Like I said, I don't know if this has anything to do with what's going on in the basement, but my TV's in the basement, so maybe. I hope this made sense. I don't know if anything like this has happened to anyone else, but please let me know if it has. Back when I was still going to high school, I spent the night at my best friend's place. He lived in a basement. I woke up and went to the bathroom. And as soon as I got back to the room and laid back down, I closed my eyes. Then I felt like someone or something was staring at me. I opened my eyes and saw a pale child staring me in the face. His dark eyes felt like they were staring into my soul. I yelled out for my friend, and as soon as he came into the room, the child disappeared. I told him what happened, and of course he didn't believe me. But now he says that apparently everybody who's ever slept in that room has seen him. His girlfriend, his brothers, and me. But he has never seen the boy. To this day, I can still remember what he looks like. I was never sure whether I should believe in the paranormal or not. Sure, I'd heard strange noises home alone at night or felt the energy in the house shift to something more sinister in a matter of seconds. But what I experienced in August of 2021 convinced me. It's taken a long time to process what I had experienced. I've mostly tried to pretend that it didn't happen. And to be honest, I really wish it hadn't. For context, last August, I had moved into the guest bedroom in our basement. I'm 15, and having the entire basement to myself for most of the day and all night was awesome. I immediately began to regret my decision, though, as I discovered how unsettling the energy in my basement is. It's really hard to explain, but it just feels off, especially at night. I was literally always on edge whenever I was down there. Sleeping was quite difficult, as I was never really calm. I often felt an overwhelming presence watching over me, and I was really hating my decision. But I knew my mom would be upset if I changed my mind so soon, so I endured the hell I was living in. I quickly need to describe the layout of my basement so you can understand where everything is taking place. Once you enter my basement, there's a large living area. Attached to that is a hallway that leads to where I've been sleeping. So I woke up at around one to two in the morning to the sounds of about four voices in the living area of the basement. I could never actually make out what they were talking about, maybe because I had just woken up, but I'm pretty sure they were speaking in another language or maybe very broken English. As I was listening to the voices, I heard quiet footsteps approaching my door. The only way that I was sure they were footsteps was because the floor in our basement, especially in the hallway, is very creaky. I pulled the covers over my head and shut my eyes. I fell asleep almost immediately and nothing else happened that night. I've also felt people touch me in the basement, but usually those experiences are comforting. I usually believe that to be my father who passed away in 2015, as I've only felt those when I'm sad or angry. Still paranormal, but unrelated to the experience I just told you about. Either way, that experience in the basement terrified me. 
and I'm still not sure how to explain it. Every night, I walk down the stairs to the basement and then into my gaming room to unwind with some video games. As I reach the bottom of the stairs, I turn on the light, but I keep it dimmed, just so I can make my way to my room. At about midnight, it's time to go to sleep, so I open the door of my gaming room to find the lights completely turned off. I deliberately keep the switch at halfway, and when I go to the staircase, they're always pulled all the way down. I've always thought that it was my wife who would come downstairs and shut them off. I politely asked her why she would shut the lights off, and she replied, I've never gone downstairs to shut the lights off, not even once. For context, I've seen shadowy images run by in the basement. I dismissed it as being fatigue. However, when my niece was just three years old, she said that there was a boy with red eyes on the staircase. We thought it was just her childhood imagination. Then when my son was two to three years old, he ran into my arms after staring at the staircase. I asked him what was wrong, and finally he said, there's spooky with red eyes. Could entities actually physically manipulate the light switch? I can't explain what's going on. My dad works for a contracting company in St. Louis, Missouri. The building's interior is exactly the same as it was in the 1960s all except for the dust and deterioration. The actual date of construction is 1910. It's only a five-story tall building. It's nothing immensely big. It was previously used as a law firm, but when the firm left, they decided not to take anything with them. There were tons of law books, paintings, desks, etc. But the basement. Back in 1960, they started to renovate it, but never finished. So the basement is an extremely dilapidated 1910s paint falling off, broken glass ridden, rusting freight elevator, deadly tetanus infested nail cesspit. But my dad and I went in there anyway. Keep this in mind. My dad coaches boxing as a hobby and he's huge, all muscle. He's fought all his life. And even he is scared of that basement. Every time we go down there, something is different. The first time I remember going down there, the plaster on the walls of a hallway had fallen, and I mean all of it. The whole hallway was stripped down to its bare structure. I assumed, of course, it was because of the renovation, but my dad said, what's all this shit? It wasn't here before. So we go down the hallway, and yeah, in and of itself, it's nothing really special, but there was a metal chair in the middle of this dark hallway and for whatever reason, it just freaked me out. My dad turned on the lights and they worked for a second, but then they all busted. Some of them just fizzled out, probably because of how old they were. So down the hall, there was a boiler room. It contained this rubberized trench coat, rubberized to avoid stains, and a bowling ball bag. Inside the bowling ball bag was a cleaver with what I assume was a deer bone handle. After that, we left. A few weeks later, we came back down and all the plaster on the floor was gone. We went to the end of the hallway and the boiler room door was closed. Maybe we closed it, but I don't remember doing that at all. It doesn't seem like our priority would have been to close that door when we were getting out of there. By the way, nobody has the key to the building except my dad. He and I are the only ones to enter the building ever. At the end, there was a T-shaped intersection. On the wall, there were three identical pictures of the same exact priest with a deadpan expression. His eyes were glazed over like he was possessed or couldn't see or something. 
We came back after a few months, near Christmas. We only made it down the steps and immediately left. There was a Christmas tree, little lights blinking, and a Santa Claus doll with the most indescribably creepy grin I've ever seen in my life. Something was definitely going on in that basement. When I was 13, I babysat a little girl named Emma, one of the sweetest kids you could think of. I was a regular babysitter for her, so much so that when I couldn't babysit for a few months, she called all her other babysitters by my name. This happened after I came back to being a regular babysitter for her. It was about 10.30 at night. I had already put Emma to bed and had been channel surfing. The house was set up so that the front half was open concept. The living room, dining room, and kitchen were side by side. In between the living room and dining room was an open doorway to the back half of the house. At one end was Emma's room, and the other end had her parents, with the bathroom connected to the parents' room. While I was sitting on the couch, I heard something run down the hall to the bathroom. Assuming it was just Emma going to the bathroom, I let it be. A few minutes went by, and I heard the feet heading back down the hall. I turned to tell her to go back and make sure she flushed, because I hadn't heard it, but I only saw the tips of black hair that ran past the open doorway. Here's the problem. Emma is blonde. I quickly jumped up and rushed to Emma's bedroom, throwing open the door. Her nightlight was bright enough to make her out as she sat up and looked at me, rubbing her eyes in confusion. I asked her if she had just gone to the bathroom. When she shook her head, I did a once-over of her room, checking under her bed, and a quick peek in her closet. I didn't see anything, so I told Emma I was just double-checking for monsters. I tucked Emma back in, saying goodnight, and as I headed out of her room, leaving the door slightly open, I stopped when I heard her speak. I thought she was going to call me back in and ask me something. But instead, I hear her say, You should have said something. Don't scare her. I really like her. I didn't say anything to the mom about it, and I continued to babysit Emma. Or I did until they moved away. I always made an effort after that to include the second child I didn't know I was babysitting. If Emma was drawing, an extra spot was set up. If she was eating, another chair and table setting was set up. It seemed to make Emma happy, and nothing ever startled me again. Still, weirds me out. An Aswang is a monster in Filipino mythology that preys on pregnant women. Unlike the grisly attacks usually shown in horror movies, however, these monsters apparently just prey on the life essence of the unborn baby until it dies and the mother miscarries. The scary part is that these monsters are also part human, meaning that during the day, they could literally be anyone. This happened in Metro Manila in around 2011. My cousin told me the old man with the new neighbors asked me if he were pregnant. I was shocked. I never even told my family yet. I was 21 and worked nights in a call center. I never go outside when I'm home and I was only a few weeks along, so I know I wasn't showing yet. How did this nosy old man know? She said the neighbors were new in town, coming from one of the more popular provinces in the Philippines, where witchcraft and aswans are still the norm. They were friendly enough though, so no one really had anything bad to say about them other than the nasty rumors that they knew about Aswan. When I was about eight months along, I was watching late night TV with my brother at around 2 a.m. Something big landed on our tin roof, strong enough to rattle the windows. My brother and I looked at each other with wide eyes as we listened to the footsteps. Yes, footsteps. Stop right above me. I was never a prayerful person, 
But at that moment, I called on gods and saints and angels and anything to protect my baby. Then I remembered my grandmother's story about how she escaped an Aswang attack by placing a pillow between her legs to mask the baby's scent. So I did just that. We had no idea how long we waited. Seconds, minutes, but then we heard another jump and silence. Until this very day, I'm glad that my brother was with me to vouch for me. I still couldn't believe that it happened and that it happened to me. Then I remembered the nosy old man. Could it have been him? Was he really an Aswang? Something weird and mysterious and unfinished, I suppose, but all's well that ends well, right? It started on my commute home from work. I got about halfway through the 20 minute walk and at roughly 10.10, I saw these two flying objects that were blinking red and white. I didn't think much of it being as I live near an airport. That is, until I saw them fly toward each other, hover for a moment, and then depart in opposite directions. It's something that I've never seen drones or planes do before, and it got me really suspicious. I began following one of them, and it kept variating between moving very quickly, slowing down, and hovering in midair. I kept on the trail of that one up until I saw two more on the opposite end of the horizon. I began chasing them down, one by one, trying to get videos and keeping notes on what I'd seen. The main thing that spooked me, aside from the weird movements, was the oblong shape of them. They were just far enough visually that I could only really see the shape through the horizontal row of blinking lights, of which there were three on each flying object. Each one would blink the same pattern, the red lights flashing one after another, and then a white flash at the end, occurring uniformly every few seconds. I only saw them do bizarre movements a handful of times, otherwise I was just chasing them as they sped by. There were at least five of them throughout my entire voyage, all around the town. I would truly love to believe that they were just regular aircraft, but every single thing about them was weird. I took a couple of videos, but they didn't really come out. My camera can't shoot that well in the dark. If anybody can point me in the direction of what these things might be, or what the light patterns might mean, or really anything at all, let me know. It's been haunting me all night. I saw a UFO. And I just want to know if there's some kind of explanation for what I saw. I didn't have my phone with me, so I don't have any evidence. But I did see a UFO. At first I thought it was a glare, but the moon was behind me and I was seeing Orion's belt and some other stars in front of me. The first one I saw was on the left. Then I realized it was moving in one direction, so it couldn't be a glare. It was going northward. I also don't think that it was a plane because of the lockdown. Planes weren't really allowed to fly, and if they were, it was really limited. I definitely know what a plane looks and sounds like, and this was not it. The thing that I saw was just silently cruising in the sky. Seconds later, I saw one to the right. I saw small dots emitting light. It was as small as what stars look like at night, but they weren't twinkling, and the lighted dots were aligned in a constant position. I also saw that it changed its angle a bit after I saw the lighted dots. I asked myself if they could have been birds, migrating or passing by, because sometimes flocks of birds fly in a V-shape, but that doesn't explain the glow. I'm not sure how high it was exactly in the sky, but it was definitely in the zone where a plane might fly, but it was way too big to be a plane. It was cruising for a good few seconds, 
until it literally just vanished. Would there be any other explanation? Is that what a stealth bomber looks like at night? It was definitely a UFO, because it was an object flying in the sky and I didn't know what it was. So it was an unidentified flying object. I just want to know if it was alien or not. Ever since I was 13, in 2008, I have developed an interest in aliens and UFOs. I have grown enough of an interest to actually create a scrapbook of pictures of UFOs, declassified government documents, newspaper clippings, and things like that. All of these things were available from Google. I even recorded my own UFO sightings here and there, but I eventually threw them out because I was worried that I was sticking my nose where it didn't belong. In any case, this is one of my UFO experiences. It was somewhere between 2009 and 2011. I was around 14 to 16. It was around 8 or 9 p.m., and I was looking into the sky to see if I might get lucky and find a UFO. I noticed a large triangular-shaped silhouette facing west into my backyard. It was huge, and it had a red light at the center. Parts of the craft warped into a boomerang shape. One part was invisible at times, and the other part wasn't. It was as if it had some invisible shield that was on and then off. It was able to change its shape from a boomerang and then into a triangle and then just disappear. In the past, I've had other UFO experiences, but this one was the most convincing one of my whole life. Does anyone else have any UFO experiences? If you do, I'd love to hear them. I will start by saying I was a devout skeptic before this experience. It has changed me. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born, and my family and I had some old family friends over at our house. We'd been hanging out nearly all day, and it was getting to be around the time of sunset. My friend and I, who I'll refer to as Adam, went on a walk to the ponds in my neighborhood and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes, just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we begin the short walk back to my house when I noticed a star in the sky, which appeared to be moving. I tell Adam this, and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway, looking up at the sky. We watched the star for roughly five minutes when we noticed two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. Adam pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see, sadly. Nearly immediately after Adam had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars, and formed a large triangle. These lights then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping, then proceeded to move at a speed which I've never seen before, away from each other, and disappeared into the night. Based on the reactions of people back at the house, both Adam and I were visibly shaken up. When we tried to explain what had happened, they shrugged it off, as us just not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, and so does Adam. Green Cove Springs has a history of military and government establishments and compounds, none of which are currently active. However, there is a significant amount of military infrastructure still in use as housing and places of business. 
It makes me wonder if this had something to do with some sort of test flight. Either way, we saw what we saw, even if we don't know what it is. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live in the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, just to give some reference that people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug-in for my laptop there. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30 and perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village, really. Just as at the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window, when suddenly I see this bright light just over the fields. It's multicolored, and it kind of blooms, growing larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough in late March, in the middle of the lockdown. Except it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, but if I had to guess, I'd say that it was two acres or more away, and larger than a family car, hanging maybe 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually, it faded and disappeared again, not behaving anything like a firework, and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later, I glanced out again, and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot, but it vanished almost the moment I looked at it. This light was maybe a third of the size of the original and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Bally Money Town firework display is much further away and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we'd have heard it. A drone still strikes me as most likely. We wouldn't have heard it inside the house, and I guess it might have been rigged with powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful. So, I don't know. I've never, ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime, and I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think maybe I saw a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media, though, and I haven't seen anything since, so who knows? I thought I'd share a few stories that I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mom that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, there's this one bush road that takes you from the reserve deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road once, but now we just call it the limit. And we use that area of the forest for camping, fishing, ski-doo riding, and four-wheeler riding, stuff like that. It's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. Anyway, she had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad has even had an experience on this road too. It's kind of known for all sorts of strange things happening but it's fine. Nobody's scared of it. I still go drive down it to watch pretty sunsets. It's just chill like that. The first story is about a weird time loop. 
She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones you could use to call for help. So they started walking. They weren't too far and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. They think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they get closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get even closer and they realize that no, it's the same car. They're confused as heck, but can completely verify that it is their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they had left it. And honestly, they just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off that dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail that they could turn off on. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking as it's all they could do. They keep going and sure enough, up ahead down the road, there's a parked car, the same as before. This time they are tripping out and they run up to it and yep, it is 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods and leaves it on the hood of the car, saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, at least they can see if the stick would have been moved take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described the feeling of being afraid that the time loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk farther and eventually they made it back to the reservation. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what happened with the car and the time loop. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. And I don't have any idea either. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later, after the first incident, maybe in the early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car having a few beers, not the driver obviously, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there were no trails there. They look over to see what he's talking about, and all they can see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. They could see that there's a source of light, but they couldn't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She says that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was just this feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but that it almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights. But then, whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago that she told me about it and that it happened that I wish I could describe more about how it looked. But she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colors that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds, and then it just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. Those are her experiences. It's weird, too, that everyone's experiences on this road are so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, time loops, and then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer with no source. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit. Apparently it's the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies keep trying to build mines and we keep refusing. 
I'm wondering if that has something to do with it. Because the amount of paranormal things that happened around here is pretty wild. I'm going to try to make this short by stating just the simple facts of what I witnessed during two separate incidents. Incident number one. This is going back to the late summer of either 1989 or 1990. I was at work with two coworkers near Rhinebeck, New York. One of my coworkers was outside smoking when he called to me and another coworker to come outside and see something. When we exited the front door, we saw the classic V-shaped craft hovering above a tree in the front yard. It was directly above the tree, which was just about the height of the building, two stories, so maybe 30 feet. I ran up to the tree, which put the craft those same 30 feet above me. It had five to seven white lights, with the largest at the bottom center of the V, with the others running up from it. It made no noise, and even though whatever it was blocked out the sky, I couldn't make out a structure or body. It very slowly and silently started heading across the street and over a hill. My two co-workers went inside, but I remained in case it came back. It did. When it reappeared from behind the hill, the shape had changed. The lights were now in a straight line and were more of an orange color. It headed back toward my location, changing shape as it moved. The light formations just kept shifting. It took on the shape of a diamond, then an X, then back to a V, before it moved directly over the building. It kept going in that direction and then headed south and out of sight. Incident number two, I was at home. Having recently moved into a new apartment, things weren't all organized and my new bed had not arrived, so I fell asleep on the floor. I should also mention here that I am an incredibly heavy sleeper. During the night, I woke up from a sound sleep and sat straight up. This was something that I had never done. Anyway, the corner of the room was lit up with what looked like dozens of very pale, multicolored lights. Staring at them, I noticed a shadow of a figure out of the corner of my right eye. It looked as though it was moving closer, and then, well, that's all I remember. The next day I woke up not immediately remembering what I had seen. All of the clocks in the house were either stopped at or flashing at 3 a.m. Even the VCR flashed that time and was also playing even though there was no tape in it. I had to unplug everything that had an electronic clock in the apartment in order to reset and fix things. It wasn't until I was doing that that I remembered what had taken place. I've been told that I should try hypnosis regarding the second incident, but I'm not really sure that I trust the practice. One of my friends is actually a licensed hypnotherapist, or whatever you call them, but I still don't know. In all honesty, I don't know if I want to know. Back when I was a child, I had a weird UFO experience. My dad had bought a new Ford truck after his beloved Bronco had to go. We went on a visit to my grandma's place on the reservation. We picked her up and we all went fishing together and had a really nice picnic. I remember that I had this really cool Disney swimming pool. Anyway, we were all driving home when this huge aircraft of some kind appeared on the way to San Carlos, Arizona. It was not on some secluded dirt or back road. It was on Interstate 70 between Globe and Paradox. It was huge. It was like the size of a Zeppelin. It had lights all along its length, which flashed blue, red, yellow, and green in about one second. We were stunned. 
It sat there for quite a long time in one spot. We passed an ambulance coming the other way, and also a police officer who pulled over in our lane looking up at this thing. I was very young, but I was there with my parents and my grandma. My grandma has since passed on, but my parents still remember it. My mom calls the lights on the side of the UFO windows, but to me they just looked like a row of extremely bright lights. It stayed stationary for a long while before suddenly moving south to the top of Mount Turnbull. Then it went straight upwards and disappeared into the sky. The moon was out and the only clouds were above the summit. I think about this experience from time to time and sometimes I doubt myself as to whether or not any of it happened. But there were three adults in the truck who saw it and the police officer on the side of the road too. I wish I could find the other people who saw it and ask if they remember it too. In my life, I think I have seen a UFO twice. I just want to know what everybody thinks. Number one. I was 14 and I was in Spain. I was looking up at the night sky when suddenly this kind of round thing flew low overhead. From what I remember, it was round with yellow and small white lights around the underside. It was really odd. I remember seeing it, but my family says it never happened. But I know what I saw. Number two. This one originally looked like a star sitting outside the back of our house one night we were all looking up and we saw this star moving across the sky we were all like oh look a satellite we were tracking it going west but then things got strange it stopped and started going west you might say oh well perhaps it was a plane planes don't move like that it stopped again then went north and then it just disappeared, just blinked out. Did I see a UFO? Back in 2011, on a family vacation in Jamaica, my siblings and I were sitting on the beach stargazing. That is, until we noticed this one point of light that was moving unnaturally and without sound. It had the brightest color and it looked kind of like a dim star, except that it was moving in circular and figure eight type patterns. For perspective, the patterns were no bigger in diameter than the little dipper's cup. It was moving with the pattern and speed reminiscent of when one uses a laser pointer to get a cat's attention. 15 to 20 minutes after noticing it, it just faded away. Could this have been a weather balloon? It definitely wasn't a plane, a helicopter, or a satellite. At least none like the ones I've ever seen. I'm trying to find images of weather balloons from the ground at night, but every image is too close up or simply doesn't look at all like what I saw. This isn't my story, but it's something that happened to my parents just a bit ago. They live in Western New York, upstate and are really open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens for reasons other than this encounter, but that's a story for another day. It might be a good time to add here that my parents do not use drugs or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition go. I'm going to copy and paste a message that my mom sent me and just read it for you, if that's okay. I just figured I'd put some feelers out there and see if anybody else has experienced something similar or has any sort of explanation. 
Quote, Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a freaking UFO or something. Between Randolph and Steenberg, there was this huge, really bright light blinking on and off in the sky directly in front of us. And it was falling from the sky, except it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that is not a falling star. And even though I thought that it might have been a plane, I knew that it was too bright and going too fast to be one. Plus, as far as I know, planes don't make a habit of going straight down. Then, all of a sudden, it was gone. Like, mid-sky. And I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or into the trees. So, right then, I said, did you see that? And Dad goes, what the F was that? He said that he was thinking the same things that I was. And at the same time, we both noticed there are no hills. There is no mountain. There's nothing for this thing to go behind. It was just cornfields and open space. This thing just disappeared. Next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky. And it shot directly upward, back up into the sky. I was looking out my rearview mirror and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around. But the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad was turned around watching it, and it started following us. We had that same eerie feeling we had when we saw the Bigfoot that one time, and we were saying, what the F is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. They have no idea what it was that they experienced. And yes, they do also have a Bigfoot sighting, but that's a story for another day as well. Either way, they've been trying to figure out what in the world they saw. So I thought I'd share their story and see if anybody else had any ideas. This happened three to four years ago, and I've been thinking about it recently. It was late one night, around 11.30 p.m., and I was driving home from my job at Sonic. I was taking US Route 64 home, which is a fairly desolate stretch of road with houses and farmland on either side. I was in my 99 Ford Explorer, and I was just driving along around 65 to 70 miles per hour with the radio on low volume. As I'm driving, through the sunroof comes a bright green ray of light that envelops the interior of my vehicle. This lasts for about two to three seconds. Then, it disappears without a trace. After that happened, I just sped up and got home as quickly as possible. I was only about five minutes away. That's really about all there was to it, but I was really freaked out. I have pondered and pondered, but I have no clue what that could have been. I wasn't tired because I woke up at around five or six that day, and I have no history of any illnesses that could have caused this. I wasn't on any medications. I've told a few people, and I don't think that they believe I'm lying. I've never been the kind to lie about that kind of thing, but no one can give me a solid answer either. Some have said maybe it was a laser, but I don't think there's any way a laser could completely cover my vehicle in green light like that. There was a farm that I was passing by, but it wasn't lit and there were no street lights. I have no idea what it was that I encountered. I can't quite understand this one myself, so maybe you guys can help. This was on the 11th of July, 2019. My boyfriend and I, he's now my husband, were camping in the mountains, very high up. This area is so high up and remote that there is virtually no light pollution, so you can see almost every star in the sky when it's a clear night, like this one was. 
We were just relaxing, staring at the stars, usual romantic things you do in the mountains, when we started noticing the stars acting very differently. They appeared to zigzag and go upward, almost like they were playing with one another, weaving near each other and away again in circular motions. We were just amazed by it all and couldn't take our eyes off the sky. This went on for about two to three solid hours. That wasn't the strangest part though. Where we were camping, there was a clear view of an opening between two other mountains. At around 2 a.m., maybe 3, I noticed this bright light between the two mountains. It was really bright, so I nudged my partner to look over too. We were staring at this massive white-yellow looking star go upward quickly, then noticed it was going toward us. My partner is a man that isn't easily scared, and this really scared him to the point that he nearly broke my nose trying to hide fully in the tent with both of us screaming as this star just stopped right above us. When it was above us, right before we both panicked, it seemed to have a diamond type shape and it was super bright. But that isn't the strangest part. When we were in the tent, the light didn't shine through the tent. This thing didn't make a single noise so it wasn't a drone or anything like that. It was far too big. And what seemed like seconds later, we were both calm looking at the stars again, like nothing happened until sunrise. If both of us hadn't experienced this, if it was just one of us, I could try to make an excuse for it. But we both confirm each other's stories and saw the same exact thing, and I can't explain it. To top it all off, when I'm talking about it, or in this case typing, it feels like I'm lying and my partner feels the same way, like it never happened. It feels like I'm making it up, and the more I try to remember about that night, the more I can't remember. And he feels the same way too. It's like whenever I go to tell my story, something is actively trying to get me to believe that I didn't see what I saw or to stop talking about it. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? Does anyone have some answers? I'd love to know. I'll start out by saying that I've seen my fair share of strange things in the skies, but one memory will always stand out amongst the others. I've done the math and I believe it was fall of 2005. I was in sixth grade, outside on the phone with my first boyfriend. I'd say it was between six to eight o'clock Eastern time at night. It was dark outside and only our back porch light was on. I was talking up a storm and I was watching my two dogs roam the backyard. Out of nowhere, it was like somebody turned on a blue light above us, the dogs and I. It was a bright, beautiful electric blue. I immediately looked up and saw what I can best describe as the shape of an eye, but perfectly symmetrical in the same blue color. It was lined with an almost holographic looking light a constantly changing rainbow of colors. I stared for maybe two seconds before it closed up, leaving only the colorful outline. It immediately shot to the left like a shooting star and disappeared. In shock, I told my boyfriend I would call him back and I immediately ran to my parents who were folding clothes in the bedroom. I shouted at them, I just saw aliens. They laughed at first and told me to stop joking, but my father knows my eyes. He saw my panic and quickly changed the subject. I've never forgotten this moment. I can still see it so clearly, even to this day. What did I see? Why did I see it? Can anyone help?
About two months ago, I was driving home from my parents' house late at night on a route that connects New York to Connecticut. My town in Connecticut directly borders New York State. The town has some serious hills bordering on small mountains. At one point on the route, the trees thin out to the left, revealing a large hill or small mountain, which can be seen pretty clearly from different perspectives for about two minutes. As I was driving on this particular night, I noticed two large, slow blinking and slow moving rectangular lights low in the sky. I couldn't see any specific features of any craft surrounding these lights, so my perspective could be off, but it seemed to me to be only about 20 meters higher than the top of the hill. I'm guessing the distance or height by how fuzzy the edges of the light seemed to be and by how large they appeared to be in addition to the multiple perspectives provided by my consistent 40 miles per hour speed on the road. When I spotted it, it was nearly directly forward in my line of sight, off to the left just a bit. In the two minutes that I watched it, it moved maybe a half a mile farther to my left. For reference, the top of the hill that I mentioned is about a mile from that road in the same direction to the left. That would mean a speed of about 15 miles per hour. The lights were blinking too slowly to be standard aircraft strobes, on for about two seconds, off for another two, in a regular rhythm. They were moving and blinking in unison, which implies that they were both part of one larger thing. They seemed to be set about 30 to 40 yards apart from one another. There was no noticeable sound, and no witnesses aside from myself that I know of. I had always thought that if I saw a UFO, I would love to follow it, but I was too freaked out and I didn't do that. I felt like an instinctive horror. I couldn't bring myself to deliberately get closer. If there is a next time, I will try harder to overcome that. So call me crazy, and I'm sure some people will, that's okay. But I swear this happened to me when I was 16. What's weirder is that it happened on the same night that I had an alien abduction dream. My mom wasn't home. She worked nights looking after the elderly at a nearby retirement home. I lived a normal teenage night playing video games, messaging friends, and watching TV. I went to my room and went to sleep. I had an extremely intense nightmare that I was abducted by aliens. All I remembered is looking up in my dream and seeing my whole field of vision turn completely white as I simultaneously heard this really loud buzzing or humming sound. I wake up drenched in sweat, heart pounding, and it's around 5.30 in the morning. But what's weirder is that I'm not in my bed. Confused as heck, I look around the room and to my surprise, I'm somehow in my mom's room, frozen in fear and confused. I tried to figure out what was going on. After about 20 to 30 minutes, I finally calmed myself down enough to get up. So I get up and when I go downstairs, I can see through the door to our backyard, which is made of glass and I can clearly see that the gate to our backyard is wide open. It's an old fashioned wooden gate and it hadn't been opened in years because it was covered in vines and was always left locked. I go to investigate and as I go to unlock the back door, the door handle goes down with no resistance at all. And I realize, crap, this door is already unlocked, which only added to how shook up I was to be honest. So hesitantly, I go into the backyard anyway, and I look at the gate, which is also open. I look for footprints or boot marks, thinking that somebody must have kicked the gate open. Nothing. I look more closely. The old rusty lock to the gate, which hasn't been opened in years, is still there. Not bent, not damaged, not broken at all. Just a bit rusty, the same as it's always been. I lock that gate back up and look around the yard. 
Nothing's missing. I go back in the house. I lock the back door and take a real good look around and nothing's missing. I go back to my bedroom and double check that I did get in my bed that night and yep, I definitely did. The bed's still messy. I thought, did I sleepwalk? Did I go into the yard and then somehow go get in my mom's bed? I checked the carpet and floors in the house, which certainly would have been dirty and muddy if I had walked into the yard and then back in. And nothing. I called my mom and explained everything that had happened, and I asked if she had messed with the gate or unlocked it lately. She confirmed that she hadn't, and was just as surprised and confused as I was. To this day, I have no explanation as to what happened that night. Just to confirm, I was very into sports as a teenager. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't take substances, and I was completely sober. I also remember feeling oddly terrified of the sky as it began to get dark out that evening. I remember sometimes that if I was playing football or soccer with friends after that and it started getting dark, instead of walking home like I usually would, I'd kind of hustle. I'd constantly look up at the sky feeling fear. And I remember a number of times where I decided to just run home instead because I was scared, even months later. All of this still confuses me, even to this day. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one, since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway, I woke up at 2, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall, lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. My first thought was, oh, it's an owl, or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, as the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away, and once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom, the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground, pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction. Like an air hockey puck, 
perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow, maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house, yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? In the front yard, I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures, it just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird. It was definitely not a plane. I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son on the same deck at the same house. We have since moved though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone. So I was amazed at all the apps, even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, hey, there's no star there, it zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise if I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance, but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them, and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. I'm a lucid dreamer and I can control my dreams and my nightmares. But last night I had a dream that was very different from anything else. I was working on the floor of my factory job and running the forklift like normal until out the bay door there were fireworks. It's more like a plume of light and an explosion coming from the other side of the valley. I live in the desert. We don't have valleys where I'm at. We decided to go outside after seeing these lights fly away into the sky to the left of us. Once we get outside of the bay door, the ground is illuminated like a full moon times 10. We were now in the backyard of my childhood house. We look up to the sky trying to find the light source, but it was just a night sky. When we looked to the right, there was a typical looking alien and when it noticed us, it screeched and jumped up toward us but it dissolved into the brightening light. I woke up in a scream and I couldn't sleep until daylight. My cat, who's pretty aware as well, stared at the wall behind me for a good 30 minutes. Now I can dream about scary stuff and when it happens, I can usually alter it. I can always control what I'm dreaming about, but this was different and I haven't dreamed about aliens in over 10 years. What is this supposed to mean? Have they decided to come back? Why me? Mm -hmm. 
This happened probably about two years ago, except my memory of when it happened is really hazy and I struggle to place it on my timeline. I would say I was about 15 years old and it was the middle of the night. I live in a two-story house and the second story is quite high, so I sleep with the curtains wide open as I like to look at the stars. For reference, the window that's in this room takes up almost the whole wall. I woke up one night and my room was completely bright. My bed is in the corner opposite the window and all I could see out in my window was a blinding light taking up the entire window. My bedroom was completely lit up and I could barely look out the window because it was like looking into the sun. I sat there for probably about two minutes absolutely paralyzed with fear before I decided to grab my phone and film it. The second I grabbed my phone, the light went out and my room went back to dark. I couldn't make out anything through the window as my eyes had to adjust since it had been so bright. And once I could see, after about maybe a minute, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I wrote myself a note to look at in the morning because I needed evidence that it hadn't been a dream. I eventually got back into bed and tried to sleep, but the adrenaline and fear kept me up for hours. I managed to fall asleep eventually, and when I woke up, the note was exactly where I left it. I spoke to my family, but they were all adamant that they hadn't seen or heard anything. I have explored every logical possibility including sleep paralysis and night terrors, and even the possibility that I was hallucinating. But I've never hallucinated before, and I haven't since. I have no history of mental illness other than depression, which I wasn't struggling with at the time. And the same with night terrors and sleep paralysis. The note I left myself has proved to me that I wasn't asleep when it happened. This was during a time when I had some weird experiences happening while I was asleep. I would wake up with strange bruises and scratches all over my body almost every day. My memories from around that time are very hazy, and I can only remember bits and pieces. That time of my life is almost blurry to me, and I usually have an excellent memory. Any possible explanations? In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life, but here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10-minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes, 
Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the board settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them, and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day, and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around, taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with? There was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. 
The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of a sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. The weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. 13 and three. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story.